uh, the most important thing in these events is to thank the people who put it together. And it, it always amazes me how much effort it takes to, to convene an event of three or four hours and get 50, 75 people in a room. But uh, there were so many people involved in this effort, and I want to recognize everybody. Uh, Brian Hahn is the, uh, the intern who coordinated most of the work, and, uh, and Haley uh, Martinez is a staff person who pulled a lot of this together. And Meg uh, Nadia was another intern who was involved, and they really did the heavy lifting on making this happen. But I also want to thank the four programs that are sponsoring this. Uh, the Earth Institute, Steve Cohn, and, uh, and Allison Miller, uh, and at uh, Seeper, Dan uh, McIntyre, and at the Water Center, uh, Manu Lau and his staff, and uh, at the Sustainable Ag Program, uh, Walter, uh, I apologize, I can't pronounce his last name. Can you pronounce his last name? Batkin. Batkin. Uh, who's the acting director there, uh, all of whom support this effort with uh, resources and, and, uh, and guidance. So in year one, we focused on big industrial ag. And the reason we did that is because it's, generally we don't think about large agribusiness corporations when we think about sustainability. And granted, many of these large companies have very significant environmental and social impacts. But I had worked with these folks um, when I was at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and realized that nothing is black and white. And many of these companies that had publicly very bad reputations actually were launching some major sustainability efforts. So we focused on some of those initiatives in year one. And then in year two, we focused on uh, profiling local ag, primarily in this region, uh, small local agriculture, and some of the organizations that are helping to advance local agriculture. And this year, we're going to refine that a bit, still focusing very much on small uh, small local agriculture, we're going to get to definitions and discussion about terminology that is sustainable. Uh, the role that this form of agriculture is and can play in providing food and other resources, uh, other services that we'll talk about in a moment. So that's where we're going today, and I'm very fortunate to have three wonderful speakers, uh, Michael Kinstich, um, Paul Helgeson, and uh, Ruth, uh, Ruth DeFries, and I will introduce them, them in more detail a bit later and tell you about their backgrounds and what they're going to be speaking about. Uh, let me go through the agenda first of all. This session uh, will be about 25, I'm going to give a brief intro, it will be about 25 minutes for each of the speakers to uh, offer prepared remarks. And then from there we'll have a break and then a, uh, for about 15 minutes, maybe a little bit less since we got a little, uh, late start. And then we're going to have a panel discussion where uh, the panelists will let, and I will let you ask each other questions, facilitate a bit of a discussion. And then I have a couple of other guest speakers who will be coming up for a couple of minutes just to tell us about their initiatives. And from there, we'll have about a half hour of audience discussion and Q&A. And we have this room until 6, so if any of you want to stick around and network a bit, you're welcome to do that as well. Uh, so, for questions and answers, uh, if you're online, the live stream site has a question section and we'll be uh, fielding those questions, so please uh, use that feature if you're, if you're uh, online watching this show. And uh, if you're in the room, we're going to have a question card circled around the room, and uh, please take the time to fill out a question, we'll get it up here. And then if we have a little bit of extra time, I'll be able to take some folks at the mic as well. So, the first... And the first subject of, uh, of discussion is what is sustainable agriculture or what, why do we need sustainable agriculture? And uh, these are really the critical elements of sustainable agricultural systems. And as you can see, this is quite a, an all things for all people list, but it needs to be articulated. This is the goal. This is our objective of, of sustainable agriculture, to be able to feed and nourish people most, most singularly and to restore and protect the land, air, and water and other spaces. Uh, other species rather on the planet across the full product life cycle because food production is not just the farm. It's the, uh, the distribution, the processing, the retail, uh, the storage, uh, all have environmental and social impacts and all hopefully bring value along that chain. Now, if agriculture needs to be resilient uh, to and help mitigate climate change, critical element uh, now that we're coming to realize just how uh, significantly we may be impacted by climate change in the next few years. And uh, of course, it has to provide opportunities for people, livelihood and dignity for farmers, workers, and rural communities. And we're going to be touching on all these issues as we move through the day. Uh, but it is not a singular uh, form of agriculture. It is many different manifestations. 
and I'm going to touch on these a bit, but we'll get again get into more detail later. Uh, sustainable intensification is a construct that's uh, primarily embraced by the, the large agribiz community, and the essential element there is to uh, to try to produce as much food, if not more, uh, hopefully more, given our population is increasing, on the same land footprint but do this with far less chemical and energy inputs and far less impact on the, the soil itself, actually have a net positive impact on the soil, and also uh, less environmental externalities, and for that matter, social externalities off the farm. Uh, another construct is agroecology. Agroecology is an interesting uh, construct. It's, it's viewed as a science, a practice, and even a, a form of political action in its various manifestations. But the, the central precept of, of agroecology is that agriculture as a production system functions within the system of, of the our human environment and the natural environment. And this interrelationship is, 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 permanent, is prominent. And the goal in reconciling the objective of production and, and all the other things I've listed in the previous slide uh, basically requires restoring and, uh, and maintaining agrobiodiversity. And essentially what's meant by agrobiodiversity is biodiversity on and around product, productive farms uh, so that the farming practice doesn't destroy the carrying capacity of the planet, essentially. And these other forms of agri uh, sustainable agriculture listed here are, are variants, if you will, or, or slight departures on these first two. Uh, agricultural best management practices refers to what has been probably an ongoing effort in the United States since the, uh, the Great Depression uh, to improve the environmental performance of farms uh, and also the productivity of farms through university research, uh, education uh, of young people coming into the field, and what's called agricultural extension, actually getting that information out to the field to farmers, learning from those farmers, bringing that experience and knowledge from the farm back to the research lab to take best practices and evolve them and standardize them and communicate them uh, more broadly when they work effectively. And um, climate smart agriculture, I'm sorry, USDA organic is, is a standardized system in the United States to improve, uh, well, improve the quality of products by reducing the amount of chemicals that are utilized in production. Uh, climate smart ag is really a UN initiative to help small local farmers to, uh, to be more productive while minimizing their impact and, depend, and uh, uh, their impact and, um, and vulnerability to climate change. Multitrophic is a, a, an agricultural approach, very similar, but they all, at their core, view agriculture as part of a dynamic, interdependent system of life on this planet. Pardon me, I'm just getting the feel for this, guys. So this is the busiest slide here, and uh, it's um, more, more than you can digest in a single slide, but I think this is going to, this is going to, cent much of our discussion is going to center on these topics, and that is that uh, when we talk about sustainable agriculture beyond the broad concept, beyond the broad objectives that I mentioned in the earlier slides, these are the very specific things we want to attempt to optimize. Now, unfortunately, uh, there are trade-offs involved, and we'll be touching on quite a few of these trade-offs in trying to achieve all of these very specific measurable results, uh, most notably maximizing diverse yields into the future. And please do not lose that word future, because I've seen so much agricultural research on or, or so much boasting by government agencies and farm associations about the productivity on a piece of land or, or for an entire commodity this year. Well, we need to be focusing on agricultural systems that maintain and expand yield over time. And that's where you get to these other, other factors listed further below. Um, obviously, the food needs to be nutritious. We don't want a, a very productive ag system that's producing junk food. And I'm afraid much of our agriculture today is doing just that. And we want to optimize the efficient use of land, labor, and capital. Now, this one is definitely a topic that engenders uh, many trade-offs. Because there are many agricultural systems that uh, use labor very efficiently, are not very labor-intensive, but use a tremendous amount of chemical and energy inputs and use a vast amount of land. And then at the other extreme, there are, uh, there are smaller operations that don't use a lot of land, uh, but they're, intent they're incredibly labor-intensive. Both those extremes, or both those examples along the spectrum, actually have fairly good agricultural yield. There are many other situations where there's inefficient use of land, inefficient use of labor, and, uh, and low productivity. So we're trying to get to an optimization scenario here, and we'll be exploring all of those trade-offs. 
So I won't go through all the detail here, except I will mention one more element, and that is um, that we need to reduce the environmental input, uh, impact of agriculture, the footprint of agriculture. And when we speak about sustainable ag, we're, we're talking about this broad array of mechanisms, but I think they trigger, they began, that help us to begin to move toward conceptualizing sustainable agriculture uh, was the environmental impact of agriculture. And a nice little shocking sign to make that point. Um, this is a sign from Ohio, and it's about a contaminated water body that's probably been loaded with uh, too many nutrients from agricultural operations. And in the United States, uh, the prime source of water quality pollution is from agricultural operations. And uh, recently, a study by the World Resource Institute and the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences identified 530 coastal dead zones around the world with 228 marine estuaries that were all uh, being impacted by, agri by agricultural and other nutrient loading. And this is an area about 95,000 square miles in the U.S., the largest of which is the Gulf of Mexico dead zone, which is about 8,500 square miles. And the Gulf of Mexico dead zone, uh, US EPA has identified agriculture um, runoff from uh, field operations and, and animal production operations as the most significant cause of that impairment. In the Chesapeake Bay, another area that has a major dead zone, agriculture is a major contributing factor. Uh, in terms of climate impact, agriculture, forestry, and other land-based activities uh, represent 25% of all the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, which is larger than all the vehicles on the road. Uh, so clearly, if we want to address climate change, we have to address agriculture. And this is my favorite slide. I've shown this almost every lecture on agriculture. And this is a, uh, a slide from the last, uh, the most recent um, inter intergovernmental panel on climate change report, uh, profiling the likely impact of climate change on agriculture through the next 100 years. And this chart represents a compilation of about 1,100 studies uh, no standardization here at all. Some of these studies uh, looked at uh, fairly worst case scenarios in terms of climate change. Some of them were global studies, some were regional studies, some looked at individual commodities. UN, the UN group attempted to gather as much data as they can on predictions of, uh, of yield impact, yield impacts from climate change. And as you can see in the current 20 year period that we're in now, there are areas that will see a net increase in agricultural production because of climate change. Uh, I live up in the Catskills, and uh, our local economic development group is boasting about the fact that climate change is going to enhance our agricultural output. Um, they don't mention that it may only be for a few years, but nonetheless, there are some regions that are going to benefit by this change. Uh, more rain, a little bit higher temperatures, but as you can see, as you move out throughout the, uh, the century, uh, we're going to see far more areas that are impacted uh, negatively by climate change, and I, it's pure speculation to look out 100 years. But if you look at the last uh, quintile of this, you can see that there are areas that are project, project, projected rather, to have 50 to 100% loss of agricultural production. In other words, a total collapse of agricultural systems. Uh, now, this is a highly gross, highly speculative set of data, but it certainly makes the point that not only is climate change a major contributor, I'm sorry, no longer, no, <laughs> a little tongue twister. Not only is agriculture a major contributor to climate change, but it will be one of the human activities most significantly impacted by climate change. So these environmental dimensions of, of sustainable agriculture are very important and must be addressed as long as the goal, as well as the goal of feeding people and, um, and providing economic opportunities. So putting it in a more positive spin, everything is connected. The ecosystems, the food, the people, we're all one, one large mega organism, if you would, and uh, we're all related. Everything flows from the land. The soil is must be healthy and must provide uh, growing capacity for, for plants, uh, the seeds, and of course the people. This is this is the link. This is the connection. And the little chart, which is a bit hard to see in the bottom, uh, really profiles the fact that all the human capital, all the things that provide benefit for us in terms of our human well-being come either directly or indirectly from the biosphere, from the natural capital complement that is, is the planet, is the biosphere on this planet. So with this in mind, we move into sustainable agriculture and we explore what does it mean for agriculture to function within this broader system of life on the planet. So I want to I talk a little bit about small local agriculture. These terms are, are hard to define. We'll be debating them quite a bit in the next couple of hours. Uh, and there isn't a lot of real concrete data 
describing broadly a notion of local sustainable agriculture. So I pulled a few bits and pieces together to, to try to spark a, a conceptualization of what we're getting at here. So this is a chart that shows the, uh, uh, the agricultural production of, sustainable, of organic products in the U.S. and the total, which I don't have a piece of, oh yeah, it's uh, very large for me, $5.5 billion in the U.S. in 2014. And California, of course, is a big, a big producer. And uh, I'm looking for my slide, which has some great notes on it. Um, uh, but New York has a significant amount of production. And, uh, and you can see it's pretty well distributed around the, around the country. Now, um, total agricultural production is somewhere in the order of $375 billion. So $5.5 billion, not much. But it's been growing radically. And uh, this was 2014 data. This morning I found 2015 data, which shows that the total uh, agricultural output in sustainable and organic products is 6.2 billion. So in just one year, it's gone up 13%. That's quite a growth rate. Now this is a, another busy chart, but uh, this is a, a, the first study that USDA conducted on local food marketing practices. And what they identified was that there were $8.7 billion in farm revenue that were in 2015 uh, for, for products that were, that were marketed locally. And this came from 167,000 farms. And uh, the, this was um, production that was uh, within 100 miles of the point of sale. And in fact, more than half of this production was actually within 20 miles of the point of sale. And it comes from, uh, it goes to various uh, locale, locales. It could go to a, a retailer, or a wholesaler rather, it could go to a food hub, uh, it could be direct farmer to uh, customer sales, but it's, uh, it's, it's also growing rapidly. And um, I, I, of course, California, <laughs> another big player in this. Now, I want to stress, this is not an add-on to the organic. Much of this production is organic, just as much of the organic production, the previous slide, is local. Uh, and this is the data that's beginning to give us a sense that there's actually an industry here. Now, this is not big business. It's not like a, making a killing on Wall Street. But on average, these 167,000 farms uh, netted uh, $52,000 in gross income. Now, that's gross income. That's not profit. Uh, you're not going to support, support a family of four in New York City on $52,000. And after you extract all the costs of, of doing business, it's probably a lot less. But this is not mom and pop back to a gardens. This is real economic activity. And, um, and I, I played with the numbers a little bit because I'm, I'm fascinated by what this number really means, $8.7 billion. So if you look at the total uh, ag production for uh, 2015, it's $375 billion. If you net out the amount of US agriculture production that's exported, which is $133 billion, and the amount of corn that's raised for ethanol, not for food, which is 23 billion, you get a number of 219 billion dollars. So this 8.7 billion dollars on total gross sales was about 2.3 percent. When you adjust for those factors I just mentioned, it goes up to about 4 percent. And I would venture that of the remaining 219 billion dollars in sales, you've got a bit of double counting because some of that is uh, is grain that's sold to uh, animal livestock operations. So it's not ending up as uh, food, it's ending up as an input for other forms of, of food. And a lot of this also is production of sweeteners, production of junk food. So if you knock this number down even further, you, you find that local agriculture is really a significant portion of ag production in this country. So there are a lot of limitations to local agriculture. We'll be talking about them. But I want to make a point in this slide that um, that it is a real business, and it's, it's an, an economic opportunity for many regions, providing quality food for many people as well. So in our region, uh, there, is a, there are planning efforts underway to, to rationalize and improve what is this natural process of evolution of local agriculture. Uh, the Scenic Hudson, which is a local environmental group, issued the Food Shed Conservation Plan back in 2013. And what they, they did is identify where agriculture is in the Hudson Valley region, which is just north of New York, uh, where it's doing well, where it's facing challenges, where there's support infrastructure, where there's access to markets, where there are opportunities to either purchase ag land outright or purchase uh, development rights on that land so it stays in agriculture. And this plan is, was the first rationalization of a regional food construct to improve the agricultural performance of a region. More recently, 
Uh, the New England Food Vision was published in 2015, and this is a, a, a vision, not a plan, they, they emphasize that, but it's a vision for a six-state region, which traditionally had a tremendous amount of agriculture, but now a very small percentage of food is actually produced locally, perhaps with exception maybe in Maine, which still has a significant ag industry. But the goal of this plan is to produce 50% of the region's food by 2060. Uh, pretty, pretty, pretty ambitious goal, given that a very only, I wish I had a number, but only a very small percentage of food is actually produced in the region. So, um, what, what I've, there's two fascinating elements to this plan that I want to stress. The first is that um, they feel this can be done without conversion of existing forest land, existing wetland to agriculture, critical when we're trying to manage climate change. And they also run a scenario, which I think is unprecedented, where they explored how the region would survive if we lose our ability to import food from California or from abroad, which may well happen if we don't manage climate change very effectively. And they believe that they could still produce 50% uh, of the food by 2060. However, in that scenario, there would have to be some land conversion from forestry and uh, uh, from forests and, uh, and wetlands into agriculture. Uh, so there might be some painful trade-offs there, but the re the, their point was the region would not stop under a rather drastic scenario. So our presenters, I'm quite honored to have uh, Dr. Ruth DeFries, uh, Professor of Ecology and Sustainable Development here at, uh, at Columbia, and Paul Ellison, who was the former sustainability manager from uh, GNP Company, St. Cloud, Minnesota, which, was a, a, which is a large uh, regional food uh, poultry producer, and Michael Kinslich, who's the founder and CEO of Copper Sea, <coughs> spelled it, sorry, Copper Sea Distillery in the Hudson Valley. And um, what I want to stress first before I tell you their bios is this is a forum. And the reason it's a forum is because we want to have discussion. So first we're going to have discussion among the panelists, and then I very much would value the audience participating in the discussion about how exploring where does local sustainable agriculture make sense, how do we advance it where it does make sense. So if I may, let me just read and remember questions and cards and uh, online for the inquiry box. But I'm going to read uh, our speaker's bios because uh, we're really fortunate to have them with us today. Uh, Ruth DeFries is a University Professor of Ecology and Sustainable Development. She was elected as a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, one of the country's highest scientific honors, and received the MacArthur Genius Award and is a recipient of many other honors for her scientific research, in addition to 100 scientific papers. She is committed to communicating the nuances of sustainable development and the complexities uh, to broad audiences, including for a book that she just had published in the last couple of years, called The Big Ratchet, How Humanity Thrives in the Face of Natural Crisis. And Paul Helgeson, as I said, is the former director, uh, former sustainability manager for GMP Company, St. Cloud, Minnesota. He joined GMP as a sustainability manager in 2010. At that time, he represented the fourth generation in a family-owned chicken business, a company established by his great-grandfather as St. Cloud Hatcheries in 1926. Quite interesting. Uh, since then, the company has evolved from a seasonal hatchery to a full integrated chicken processor with annual sales of more than $450 million. In 2013, the company was sold, uh, and then again, most recently this past year, sold to Pilgrim's Pride, and Paul will be talking about that quite a bit. Pilgrim's Pride is probably one of the largest poultry producers in the world. Um, while he was at GMP, he initiated a number of sustainability projects, including working with the World Resource Institute, uh, to do a GHG production road test and to help set a worldwide standard for measuring a product's life cycle. And he is also the founder of something called the Field to Stewards Program, which we'll talk about, uh, a supply chain initiative focused on reducing water quality, uh, water quality impacts and other environmental impacts throughout the supply chain among all the commodity producers that produce product for, for the company. And finally, Michael Kinsick is the, as I said, the founder of and CEO of Cooper. Okay. That's right. Copper Sea Distilling in uh, Hudson Valley. It's what he calls a field glass distillery operation. And Michael is also a chartered financial analyst and special advisor to Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, or SASB, as the acronym has said. Uh, formerly, he was the head of standards setting for SASB, where he oversaw research, analytics, consult consultation, codification, and maintenance of SASB standards. Michael's career uh, spans many industries, and he has uh, worked in finance primarily. Uh, initially for a company called AXA Rosenberg with roles in both um, 
core research in helping the company manage billions of dollars in long and short term strategies. He graduated summa cum laude from in economics and philosophy from Columbia and um, had graduate studies at Northwestern in industrial engineering and Berkeley in his M in MBA program. Uh, so uh, a, lot, uh, a lot of background and exper expertise on this, on this panel today and I'm very happy to have all of them with us. So we're going to start with Michael and, um, and then from there Paul and then Ruth. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you all for uh, coming today. Um, so glad to see you all here. Um, I'm primarily going to discuss uh, value chains in the agricultural markets, both in the sort of industrial agriculture business as well as a kind of small scale, uh, how small scale agriculture fits in there. Uh, I'm going to bring a little bit of my work from SASB in to start with and talk about how standards can help drive behavior in these markets. <coughs> And then about how um, small-scale enterprises can help restore uh, local value chains. Uh, so first, just a, a big picture view of sort of the US food value chain. Um, roughly at the bottom, we have uh, the initial producers going uh, up the chain through middle tier <coughs> processors and aggregators uh, out to end consumers. Uh, so in that, on that left side, we see um, little arrows going from farmers out to consumers, restaurants, processors, etc. And notice that, you know, as, as Jeffrey pointed out, the direct-to-consumer sale of uh, farm produce is still a really, really tiny market in the United States. Um, the vast majority of agricultural value, uh, agricultural production by value, goes through the middle tier there. Uh, and what we see is, you know, there are a couple million farms in the United States, uh, and obviously hundreds of millions of consumers of food in the United States, everyone eats. Um, but that, that middle tier, that first tier from the farmers is incredibly concentrated. You have a handful of, on the meat side, um, Pilgrim's Pride, JBS, uh, Hormel, um, and just a, like, literally four or five companies that control the vast majority of um, meat aggregation and processing. Uh, you know, on the grain side, you have organizations like Continental Grain, Cargill, um, Louis Dreyfus, ADM, Bungie that really pretty much dominate the um, grain and um, feedstock aggregation market. And those companies then uh, sell to food processors, sometimes directly to grocers or restaurants. Uh, companies in there might be um, companies like Cisco. Kellogg's, um, you know, the big sort of agribusiness uh, uh, manufacturers you might typically think of. Obviously, there are tens of thousands of grocery stores in the country, but even that market is uh, has become increasingly concentrated with companies like Safeway, um, you know, really having a good bit of market power in there. And again, the food processing business, there are maybe hundreds of small um, manufacturers, but really it's, it's a handful of large companies, the Crafts, uh, post Kellogg that really kind of dominate that market. Um, so I'll talk a little about the SASB standards. Um, SASB was designed uh, as an organization to develop reporting standards for public companies to report on sustainability issues directly in their statutory filings, their SEC filings, the Form 10K uh, for international filers in the US, the 20F or 40F for Canadians. Um, However, those standards could apply to any kind of business in those industries. They're based uh, from the industry, at an industry level, industry up. Uh, and so here I represent uh, several of the food, ag, and bed industries that SASB developed standards for, specifically uh, restaurants, uh, food retailers, uh, the processed food, alcoholic bed, and non-alcoholic bed industries, and then further down the chain, meat, poultry, and dairy, and the agricultural products uh, industries. And notice I put farmers down there in, in small print. And the reason is that uh, in most cases, the agricultural processors do not directly own or control the farms that they purchase their supply from. 
In some cases, they might have the capacity to direct those farmers to implement certain farming practices. Um, but in most cases, it's really um, a hands, uh, uh, an arm's length transaction that they are um, engaging in. That's not always the case. Uh, there are certain tie-up relationships between large agricultural processors and um, larger farmers who they might work with on an ongoing basis. But uh, by and large, it's, these are commodity markets where it's um, the farmers are selling to whoever's offering the best price, and the agricultural uh, processors are, you know, competing with each other for access to the to the raw materials. So, what are some of the standards that and issues that SASB might look at in these different um, industries? So, I'll start at the bottom. Uh, in the meat, poultry, and dairy, the agricultural products markets, these sort of core production. Here, we're looking at issues like land use and ecological impacts from the sourcing. Uh, antibiotic use in animal production, that's an increasingly important issue for consumers um, and even producers uh, to, to help control the uh, efficacy of their, of their meat raising operations. Uh, animal welfare practices, you know, are the um, pigs raised in cage-free environment? Are the chickens free-ranging? These sorts of things. And then um, food safety. Uh, do these companies have good control over the um, products that are going through their systems. And so here we see, I mentioned these companies, you know, these are the large uh, agribusiness firms, ADM, Bungie, uh, Conti Cargill, JBS, Tyson, these, these are big names uh, in the markets. Uh, then in that middle tier, we've got folks who would largely source products from uh, these meat, poultry, and dairy companies, and agricultural products companies uh, to produce um, either uh, food that would go on the grocery shelf or uh, materials that would go into restaurants or sometimes direct to consumers, right? So these are organizations like Kraft and Campbell's, uh, Coke and Pepsi, Diageo, Lady InBev, Constellation. Um, again, the, the uh, distilled spirits market that I know very well is highly concentrated. Probably half a dozen companies control 90% of the production. The beer market, despite the fact that uh, craft beer now accounts for probably 15 to 20 percent of the U.S. beer market. Globally, you still have AB InBev, Coors Miller, um, Heineken, uh, and a couple of others really controlling the vast majority of that, of that market. And then in the um, uh, food retail and restaurant business, you do have several large, even though there are hundreds of thousands of restaurants in, in the U.S., there are certainly several large chains that control a lot of that, McDonald's, Burger King, uh, KFC, uh, Darden has several uh, properties as well. And then on the retail side, you've got Walmart, Whole Foods, Kroger, Safeway, um, really probably fewer than 10 uh, large companies control probably 90% of the uh, produce in the, on the food retail side. Walmart, I think alone, 20% 20, 20 of US food retail? No, it's some huge number, it's outrageous. Um, Having said all that, um, you know, with that concentration comes the opportunity to affect change through the positive actions of a small number of enterprises. And so that's where implementation of the SASB standards and driving of the SASB standards, uh, use of the SASB standards from the investor side can really make a meaningful difference on our production food system. Right? So I'll take one example here, looking at um, kind of the supply chain management and ingredient sourcing. Uh, and look a little bit deeper at what the SASB standards would, would look at to uh, analyze how companies are performing on that topic. So at the base level, uh, in land use and ecological impacts for ag products and meat, poultry, and dairy production, the kinds of things that the SASB standards address are how much water is an outfit using, uh, how, are they, how much are they consuming, how much of that is reused, recycled, how much is discharged back into the environment, how much fertilizer is being applied within these organizations uh, along different types, um, pesticide volumes, how many issues of environmental non-compliance did the organization have. And so these are um, actual metrics. These are things that can be measured. And that is what SASB asks for, in addition to a discussion and analysis of how organizations are addressing these topics to meet the challenges in the future. Um, Moving up to the processed food and beverages uh, in, that, in that middle tier, we would look at supply chain management and ingredient sourcing. So 
where are these organizations sourcing from? Which companies? Uh, what are those com What is the environmental track record of those companies? So how do their suppliers uh, conform within their own audits on environmental performance? What percentage of the food and, and uh, water um, source from those uh, companies comes from areas with high water stress? And this isn't. Um, uh, these aren't just sort of uh, issues that are thrown out, um, you know, sort of plucked from a hat as potential impacts. Uh, I'll give one example. Um, Diageo, three, four, five years ago, had a, uh, a beer plant in Ghana that had to shut down for about four months because they couldn't get access to water uh, to produce. That, you know, had direct impact on their top and bottom line. Um, and then finally, moving up to sort of food retail and restaurant chains, um, where are they sourcing their materials? Do those, does that food meet third-party uh, certified environmental standards? How are they trying to uh, improve their sourcing on uh, these metrics? So the, um, none of these by themselves is necessarily going to uh, transform the food systems, but taken together, they offer uh, consumers and, and investors an opportunity to understand how these organizations are sourcing their materials, how are they treating the ecosystems that they are producing in, and what, what is the impacts that they are, what are the impacts that they are bringing there um, in their communities. I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and um, turn to Copper Sea Stone. So uh, I founded Copper Sea six years ago with uh, my co-founder, uh, Angus McDonald, who's sadly no longer with us. Um, we were founded really with sustainable practices in mind from the get-go. Uh, our goal from the beginning was to first source hyper-locally uh, and to help restore local value chains in our um, production systems. What we discovered really kind of quickly after, I, after we got into this market is that um, we needed to up our game. Uh, we started working with some local farmers to get um, locally grown rye and corn and barley. Uh, and we discovered that some of them, many of them were growing rye for cover crops, but almost nobody was growing it to actually use as an input to another process, to an actual product. Um, it was really, you know, we could find, you know, standard, uh, you know, two-row den corn if we wanted that, but, um, Again, really hard to find uh, heirloom varietals or local varietals that, that we wanted. And so we actually had to start working with local farmers and encouraging them to grow the products specifically for us. Uh, and that was an education process, um, I think for everyone. Um, we worked with one uh, fellow, Ken Migliorelli, who's now supplying several other uh, local breweries and distilleries. Um, and helped, uh, you know, really helped him get up and running and, and make a success story out of him. <clears throat> but we also realized, um, because of the demand we were seeing from other uh, local New York producers for the grain, we needed to vertically integrate. Um, the other piece of that is, and, and this is a line I use frequently, uh, I thought I was getting into the luxury branding business when I started Copper Sea Distilling and I quickly discovered that I was getting into the materials handling business. So we take, uh, to make a batch of whiskey, um, our production scale is about uh, 500 gallon mash, mash tub. We use wooden fermentation tanks. And that 500 gallon mash tub takes about 100 ga 400 gallons of water and about 500, 600 pounds of grain. Uh, we grind up the grain, mill it, um, and make a bit of a kind of a, an oatmeal-y kind of a slurry that goes into the still. We process that twice, and at the end of that process, we have about 30 gallons of spirit that we can put in the barrel, and about 400 gallons of this you know, spent mash left over. Um, distilleries here in the city essentially just flush that down this toilet and, and send it to the local um, processing plant down in, uh, uh, I guess it's in Greenpoint, I guess the big, uh, the big plant there. Um, we don't do that. Uh, we are on a farm. We can't discharge our, our waste into the local watershed. Uh, the EPA frowns on that still, although I hear that might be changing soon. Um, but we wouldn't do that anyway, even if, even if they said it was okay, because we know it's not okay. Um, 
What we do do is uh, raise higher degree pigs. So in the lower right hand corner there, you see a couple of our pigs from last year. We started with five two years ago. Last year we did 14, this year we'll do 20. Uh, we have absolutely no problem getting uh, uh, farm table restaurants in the New York area to uh, compete for those. Last year we sent those to um, Fish and Game up in Hudson, which is uh, Zach Palacio's restaurant. Zach uh, <coughs> worked at the Fatty Crab down in the uh, Lower East Side for many years and then started Fish and Game. About the same time we started Copper Sea, and uh, he won a James Beer Award last year. Uh, the other restaurant that gets our pigs this year or last year was uh, Blue Hill at Stone Barns, which I'm sure is a, a very well known. Stone Barns is an uh, education center for sustainable agricultural practices like we're talking about today. Um, so the upper left there is a picture of uh, some, uh, I'm thinking that's rye in the field there, looking east, I'm sorry, west towards Bonnie Craig. Uh, we operate a 73 acre organic farm outside of New Paltz. We grow uh, some of our grain for processing. We still do contract with Ken and other local farmers for our grain for our, um, for our whiskey. The lower left there, uh, this is to Jeff's point about the uh, agricultural extensions. Uh, we had great input from a fellow named Mike Goltonen uh, at Cornell who is a noted expert on uh, pears and pear varietals, and he helped us uh, get an orchard planted that will take several years to fill in and start producing, but we intend to um, make a Domaine uh, Fonte style pear brandy, uh, uh, it's a storied French style of um, uh, fruit whiskey, uh, fruit uh, brandy rather. And then the upper right there, um, I put in that picture because, you know, it's kind of cool to show us harvesting some corn, we are um, in the process of um, uh, basically developing our own land race corn, so a varietal that will be native to our own uh, our own farm. So we're here breeding uh, heritage, uh, open pollinated heritage varietals of corn to, to get to that. It's going to take a few cycles. But the real story there is actually that combine that those guys are sitting on. Um, that's an International Harvester 912, I think, or 612. Uh, I can't remember the, the model number. It was built around 1974-75. Uh, you actually can't buy a harvester uh, of that scale now. It's just not made anymore. So part of the story that, that needs to be told is for small-scale agriculture to become viable again, there needs to be a bit of a transformation in the actual hardware that's available to farmers. And there's a lot of stories in the news now about the incredible advances in technology, these combines that will drive themselves. Uh, I do think that going forward, part of the story of um, making sure that we can access uh, you know, 10 acre plots, 20 acre plots, and make them viable again is going to be really technologically driven. Um, so here's our, here's our production process. Uh, first, you know, upper left there, we start with the field. We are a true, I said, uh, field to glass operation. So we grow grains, we harvest them. Um, we are close to the land. That gives us a lot of credibility with other farmers in the area um, and really helps us get access to the grain we need, uh, even if we can't grow ourselves on the farm. Um, we are one of, uh, I want to say now it's about eight or nine uh, distilleries in the country that malts their own grains. We were the first in New York. And um, malting is the process of uh, essentially sprouting the grain to make the enzymes in it bioavailable for conversion uh, from starch to sugar so that we can then convert the sugar to alcohol. So you need, well, I shouldn't say you need malt. If you're going to make whiskey in the traditional way, you need malt to convert your grain. You don't need a lot of it. And the, the amazing thing about malt is that any malt will convert any grain. So you can take rye malt to convert corn. Barley malt is the commonest. You know, that's, when people say malt, they typically mean barley malt. And so bourbon in the United States is generally a blend of uh, at least 50% corn by law, uh, usually another grain for flavor, rye, or wheat, or something like that, and then typically about 10% malt. Um, most industrial whiskey is made using uh, industrial amylase. It's an enzyme. You can take industrial amylase, a cup full of it, and pop it into your mash. Pops it like that. You don't need any malt. Um, many people do that. 
If you ever go to a craft distillery and you want to see the tour leader blanche, ask them you know, whether they use malt in all their whiskeys or if they use industrial amylase in any of them. That would see some interesting reaction there. In Scotland, you cannot use industrial amylase and call your whiskey whiskey. You have to use malt. So um, there are still some regulatory hurdles in other places, but certainly not in the US. Um, I mentioned we use open top fermentation. Uh, we do that because we're really trying to capture the terroir of the uh, areas we're operating in. And so there are uh, wild yeast strains that will help inoculate our whiskeys as we make them. Some of our fruit spirits, we won't even put, uh, we use a champagne yeast when we do. Some of them, they'll just, they'll just convert automatically without any uh, addition of, of uh, uh, other yeast just because there's so much floating around in the atmosphere. Uh, uh, just in the air. Um, our, our biggest differentiator is up there on the right. We use direct fired stills. Again, one of maybe three or four distilleries in the US using direct fire. Uh, there are still a couple in Scotland and, and quite a handful in France doing uh, champagne, uh, cognac rather. It is a traditional uh, brandy methodology is to use direct fired stills, so that's, that's not an uncommon uh, tactic. But for whiskey, it is still very rare. Um, as far as I know, we are the only distillery in the country doing all of these things. There are a few that do their own malt. There are a few that use open top fermenters and a few that use direct fired stills. But we combine all these things to what I call heritage methods distilling. Um, then there at the bottom, as I mentioned, we uh, turned uh, uh, a vice into a virtue. We had all this spent mash we didn't know what to do with. And we realized that raising pigs um, is really the highest and best use of that uh, spent mash. And I should mention, by the way, we're really going back to the historical uh, methodologies that prevailed. If you go back and look at um, the IRS commissioner's reports from the late 19th century, uh, if you ever have some spare time, you don't know what to do with it. Uh, there are um, pages and pages of data on um, alcohol production uh, in the different states, different volumes, and alongside it, how many cattle and pigs that those distilleries raised using their mash, because this was the uh, classic thing to do with your spent mash. And then finally, of course, we put those into bar barrels for aging, uh, <coughs> to many fine restaurants and spirits and wine stores around the country. So, um, driving us, you know, we do all these things, but what makes it possible for us as a small scale producer? So first, big massive trend that is, that is sitting in the market right now is that people want to know where the stuff they're putting in their body is coming from. Um, they want to know that it was made with integrity by an organization that cares. Uh, they, they really want to have that close relationship with their food systems. Second thing I would point to is the sort of scale versus differentiation question. When I was doing my MBA, they, they told us there were only two strategies available to us. One was scale and one was differentiation. Um, most craft distilleries that I've seen have essentially recreated an industrial distillery at a small scale. And in my mind, it's going to be really hard to make a differentiated product if you're doing the same thing as the big boys. Uh, and finally, we are 90 miles um, from New York City. Uh, we have um, millions, tens of millions of potential consumers within driving range of us. And so I envision um, being from the Bay Area myself and knowing what's happened in Napa Valley over the last 40 years, uh, I think that we are on the cusp of a um, sort of a food tourism revolution in the Hudson Valley right now. There's quite a number of, sort of wineries that have been up there for a while, but the distillery thing that is happening right now, uh, we're going to see uh, a, you know, an amazing distillery trail in the Hudson Valley throughout here. Um, and what we've seen, you know, over the last five years, just in New York, the number of breweries has been <coughs> 95 to 320. The number of distilleries, similar increase, 35 to 90. And these are, um, most of them are uh, operating under what are the, called New York farm laws. And they mandate the use of New York agricultural products. And so this is actually driving demand for New York grain growing. Uh, and demand that is not necessarily being met at this stage. So. Um, there's a real opportunity for growers, like the ones I mentioned, Kenny Borelli, Hasbro Farms, there are several others that we've worked with over the years. Um, when we started, one of the reasons we started malting our own grains is because we wanted to be 100% New York enterprise. And there were no maltsters in New York. 
There was one in Massachusetts called Valley Malt. Uh, we could have bought New York grain and shipped it there and had it shipped back, but we actually just decided to start malting ourselves. So it was a bit of a necessity as the mother of invention problem. And now there are four. Amazing. Just in the last five years, those have started out. And then um, finally, we uh, wanted to age our whiskey in barrels made in New York from New York oak. And we actually worked with a fellow up at US Barrel who was making barrel saunas and convinced him to start making uh, tight cooperage barrels for us for uh, whiskey aging. It was a several year process for him to get up to, get up to that scale, um, but we were instrumental in bringing back the first cooperage in New York, certainly since Prohibition, probably since long before. And this is a story that really goes back 150 years because it's taken that long for the forests in the Northeast to revitalize themselves after they were mostly stripped in the early 19th century. So um, this is a story of, of long-tailed agricultural cycles, and we now can harvest uh, uh, Hudson Valley oak, hopefully in a sustainable way, uh, and continue to use that going forward. Uh, this is always a chart I love. Um, there are now over 5,000 craft brewers in the United States. Uh, the craft distilled spirits market is following the craft brew market at about a 20-year lag. Um, this is a chart I put together first about five years ago when I was looking into this. And um, there's, there's, uh, we're on the cusp of massive disaggregation in a lot of these uh, end-use markets. So that's, that's the story I want to leave with, is that um, there is no reason necessarily for three producers to control 90% of the U.S. beer market. Now, uh, craft beer is 10 to, about 15 to 20% of the U.S. beer market. Uh, Glenn Carroll, who had initially done a lot of this work on the brew market, um, estimates that that could go to 75%. So <coughs> we could be at the beginning of this, we could be still be in the early innings of massive disaggregation of our food delivery systems. And that's the story on the end Thanks. Michael, thank you very much. Now Paul Helgeson is going to speak. Am I making the microphone much higher for Paul? <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, my name is Paul, and I uh, am, am often referred to as a chicken guy. So I'll be talking about chickens, which is probably less fun than and still spirits, but um, together they make great dinner. <laughs> um, I'm the fourth generation, or I was the fourth generation in a family-owned uh, poultry company called Golden Plumper GMP Company. Um, that company is similar to Purdue that you have out here on the East Coast, but maybe one-tenth the size, or, but it's still a, a relatively large company. I have an MBA and an undergrad and studied business throughout college. I'm personally interested in protecting the environment, um, and I've dabbled with multiple social entrepreneurial ideas, including the Field Stewards Program, which I'll talk about towards the end of my presentation. But today I want to talk about the history of GMP Company as sort of analogous of the history of the poultry industry as a sort of how did we get here kind of lesson because I think a lot of the challenges that the poultry industry is or the food system generally thinks they've solved the, the small local food movement is sort of challenging some of this progress and sometimes it's worthwhile challenging and sometimes we're sort of maybe reinventing the wheel so let's I'll have a few slides going through the, the history of, of GMP company um, in 1926, it was founded by my, my great-grandfather, Ian Helgeson, as a seasonal hatchery, um, something to keep them busy between golf season and hunting season. We were one of 300 hatcheries in the state. It was almost like a, a gold rush or a, a dot-com boom back then in terms of uh, new agricultural solutions for, for the small farms. There was quite a bit of uh, entrepreneurial activity, mail order through Sears catalog was new, and a common customer was, was a housewife, and, and selling small flocks to, to farm wives was a way for them to 
increase their, their and diversify the income of their farms. Um, so it really sort of started off as a way of supporting these small diversified farms. Of course, after World War II, the, the, the farming egg sector got much more industrialized. And we also got our modern kitchens with refrigerators. So that opened up the opportunity to have refrigerated meat. GMP company moved into the production of meat birds and built their own feed mill. A few decades later, they become, became vertically integrated by, by purchasing a processing plant. And so in 1983, GMP company was vertically integrated, meaning that they could hatch the chicks, they could produce the feed for the birds, and they could process the birds in the in their processing plant. That complex um, is, is a critical part for today's poultry systems and, and many chicken companies are measured on how many complexes they have. Uh, GMP company has two. I, I think Purdue probably has um, maybe 15. Uh, Tyson has about 40. Uh, we, we tried to differentiate ourselves through our brands. We, we distributed heavily in the Midwest, um, but really coast to coast and, and in all 50 states in some way. Um, with $450 million in sales in 2014, that sounds like a pretty big company. We're a little less than 2% of the US poultry production. I, I think we're ranked around the 18th largest poultry company um, in that a few years ago. And then we were sold to the Mash House, which is a pork company that processes about 250,000 hogs a year. So a little, a little larger scale than, than Mike's operation. But um, they, they were a very commodity-driven company. They felt like the hog markets were, were going to be challenging this year. So they sold GMP company to JBS, which also runs Pilgrim's Pride. That deal closed in January, and now GMP Company, my family's business, is essentially a business unit of Pilgrims and, and is being integrated into their company and their operations. So I just wanted to sort of talk a little bit about that industry now that my family's company is essentially integrated into it, into one of these top five companies that controls the majority of the market. Um, as I said, the, the vertical integration is, is a key differentiator for the large poultry companies. There's approximately 40 companies overall, but a handful produce, control most of the production. 2011 is about 9 billion birds. I think last year was probably closer to 10 billion, and around 37 billion pounds of, of finished product, making poultry or chicken meat the most popular protein in the US and the fastest growing meat in the US. Um, Part of the reason why the appeal of, of poultry is, is so compelling for American consumers, I think in a way has to do with sustainability. It has a very high feed conversion ratio. It, it doesn't take much feed to get a pound of meat. And it has relatively better animal welfare performance than, than other proteins. And there's better health uh, perceptions too. So chicken's got a lot going for it and it shows in the increase in consumption. Um, one key thing I want to sort of talk about from a sustainability perspective is the value chain or the supply chain. Um, as, as Jeffrey mentioned earlier, a lot of the impacts are in the supply chain and, and there's a lot of risk in the supply chain with, with climate change and so on. For us, we, we did some life cycle work with World Resource Institute developing a greenhouse gas carbon accounting protocol that basically maps where the carbon intensity is over this value chain. Uh, a majority of it is in the feed ingredients and the raw materials, essentially the fertilizer for the corn and the irrigated water for the, the corn and soybeans are, are a major, major driver of carbon and, and water impacts. Um, as we go through the supply chain, our processing, our the electricity we use in company-owned assets uh, is, is also a relatively major source. Um, and of, of energy use and so on. And then the part that isn't a big deal is the distribution and retail. That semi trucks are, are pretty efficient moving product around. So whether you ship something 50 miles or 500 miles, once you get it on the truck, it, it actually doesn't matter a whole lot. Um, the consumer use phase could be significant depending on how people cook it. Um, but 
you you don't really consumers never really take a whole lot of responsibility for their actions and sustainability. So from a corporate perspective, we the food industry generally is focused much more upstream and trying to get consumers to change their own behavior. So looking back over a few decades, um, you know the what has changed in the industry. The, the chicken barns obviously have gotten a lot bigger. The ventilation in the barns have improved. Um, the one on the right, the modern barn, you can see there's sort of, it's a tunnel ventilation so that it pulls air through it much more efficiently. It's a, it's a more substantial structure. There's more automation in terms of the feeding controls and so on. I, this barn technology is, is one aspect that, that helped the birds grow. Better feed formulations help and better bird genetics help. And we can see the difference in, in the chicken size over, over the last few decades. Chickens, before all these improvements, were, were pretty small and gamey. And in terms of trying to feed your family, you know, which chicken would you want to eat? In terms of what chicken looks the most natural and happy, that might be different. But what is the outcome of the food system? And for most of this time period, the signal that the producers had gotten was more calories cheaper. There was very little for sustainability driving innovation. So the signal that the food industry was got, you know, was plant fence posts or fence posts, and that focus on production efficiency really resonated throughout the supply chain and the poultry industry was really no different in responding to those market signals. But I just want to contrast the food industry with some other industries. You know, we had a telephone back then, and now I've got the internet in my pocket. So how much innovation has the egg industry really achieved? And are they innovating in the right places? And are consumers really engaged in driving this innovation in areas that, that matter? Um, these are some of the questions I brought up when I was at GMP company to help develop the four Ps of sustainability. And our four Ps are people, poultry, progress, and the planet. And the, the key is that they're interconnected. That, that Doing one thing for a trade-off of another thing, you at least should hold an awareness of what you're trading off. So, for example, antibiotics and, and animal welfare sounds like good things for human health and for for animal welfare, generally other practices like lower densities, but that that also increases the number of barns we need, increases the amount of feed we need, so there's an impact on the planet or the greenhouse gas intensity. So should we do animal welfare? Yes, but we should also be aware of the, the increased carbon footprint of making that decision. And that's really the sort of point of the four Ps and the interconnectedness of this is, is being aware of these trade-offs and to try to challenge innovation in a way that comes where we can come up with win-win solutions. So looking at the value chain, but now with the perspective of sustainability, there's three particular aspects that I want to point out. The, on the top, the American Humane Certified is an animal welfare certification. Um, the Little Windmill is a, represents renewable energy credits in our energy sourcing. And then down in the corner is the Field Stewards Program, which is an emerging idea for water quality protection and feed ingredient supply chains. Starting with the American Humane Certification was a, a certification that GMP went with um, about five years ago, maybe a little bit more. It's a third party certification. It verifies our processes and practices. It was customer driven, meaning our grocery store, the, the big companies that we would sell to, like Target, really wanted us to have this third party certification. And it helped with consumer confidence that the individual end users like the certification, but they don't really know the difference between American Humane and GAP and other certifications. They don't know all of the details that go in it. And even the people who are running the certifications don't really know if X practice is better than Y practice. And, and there's a lot of debate in what is scientifically necessary. But having a third party certification, particularly one that was about the process and the practices, and not necessarily about the end product quality. We had other certifications, other food safety type programs before this, but I think the animal welfare certifications that emerged five to ten years ago were really sort of a leading edge of consumers wanting to get better answers about where their food comes from, 
rather than just the cause of flavor burn is it safe. It's, it's kind of the tip of the spear in terms of diving back into the, the supply chain and some of those practices. Another um, thing that, that I helped lead at the GMP company was the purchase of renewable energy. And if you're familiar with renewable energy credits, it's, it's a way of tracking the production of renewable energy and, and the retirement of those production credits. In our company, we produce two brands of chicken, so having an attribute that was easy to allocate to one brand that was using similar equipment made this a, a pretty simple uh, sell. And the price of these credits have, have dropped consistently over the years, so that, that helped with, with offsetting the cost as uh, the amount of offsets increased. But basically, this, this is a good idea, and recs are, you know, they're, they're easy, so they're easy, it's good, they're easy, it's maybe not that material or additional to, to dealing with climate change, but it, it sort of set a precedent of how a company could engage in its supply chain, and I liked the thinking of it because the electric grid is a lot like the commodity agriculture grid in that they're, they're fungible commodities. You don't know what electrons are running the lights in here. We don't know if they came from a coal plant or a solar panel, but we can sort of figure it out after the fact and buy up enough credits to, to offset the electricity we're used with electricity that came from a green source. And that was the type of thinking that helped develop the field stewards program, which we were developing in Minnesota as a scalable approach to protecting water quality on egg lands, something that's cost effective like those renewable energy credits, and that would create a financial incentive or another way to recognize farmers for their efforts to protect water quality or to just be good environmental stewards. So it's a third party certification. In, we're based on a state program in Minnesota called the Minnesota Agricultural Water Quality Certification Program. That's based on the Water Quality Index. Basically, it's a score that adapts for each farm, and the slope, and the soil type, and the crops. And, and it's a big worksheet year over year that, that allows each farmer to customize each field into a management plan that respects the environment and allows them to maintain competitive yields and, and their competitive business. So it's, it's a flexible standard, but the key thing about the standard is, is that it has a scoring, and then within the scoring there's a threshold. So it scores 1 to 10, and if you're above an 8.5, then you pass, and if you're below that, you're, you're not eligible for the field stewards credits. So I'll explain a little bit how the field steward program works and how the general commodity crop system works and, and how these two can complement. Um, in the traditional system, we have a grower who grows the crops, they go down to the market, some companies bid over the price and he sells it to whatever food company and becomes some food product. And all this, the, the money's kind of flowing back through the system, but there's no tracing of one bushel to another bushel. It all gets commingled in some big barge or an elevator or something. For us, we want to single out the field stewards growers who are participating in our program, demonstrating a high level of environmental performance, and, and to give them a special distinction and to take that effort that the farmer has and connect it to the consumer in the grocery store so that the end food product is somehow connected back to this farm practice, but the elevators and the barges and everything, they're really efficient. You can't segregate or have chain of custody for the physical product in that, um, in that farm, in our industrial egg system. That, that gets prohibitively expensive. That's a huge reason why organic is, is so much more expensive is, is that segregation aspect. So if you can keep the efficiency, but you can get the benefit, that's where we're trying to that's what we're trying to achieve with the certificate market. And the certificates are, are earned on an acre basis for farmers that demonstrate this high level of water quality performance. And then there's a way to figure out the land use per functional unit for, for your product. So if you're going to eat a chicken sandwich, you can figure out approximately how much land that uses. Probably about the size of a piece of paper, actually. Um, so, so there's a way of tracing back the consumption back to the production of, of the product. And we're, I think that's another big part of the, the field stewards program that, that builds off the World Resource Institute and, and the work on the greenhouse gas protocol is, is 
providing that environmental accounting and then applying that accounting in a way that can add business value and it can help reassure consumers around supply chain sustainability and give companies a way to appropriately engage in their supply chain. Um, some of the SASB standards, as a chicken company, we don't know how much fertilizer is being applied to the corn in our supply chain, but we may be able to participate in a standard like this that would designate a certain reasonable level of fertilizer use. So anyways, I, I just put together some numbers on what field stewards credits might cost, and there's a few interesting points I want to kind of make here. So in the top left corner is the net sales pounds, or the total pounds that you would want to offset. For GMP company, it was about 457 million pounds of chicken, actually those dollars. But um, we, if we were to offset all of our production in 2014, it would be 457 million pounds. Um, for the average person, they eat about 85 pounds. And for one acre of farmland, we figured there's about 2,700 pounds of chicken produced, at least under the assumptions in this model. If you go through, um, you can, our, our field steward, if you jump down to the bottom line here, the credit pricing is at 650 per acre. Um, we try to do $5 for the farmer and $1.50 for the admin expenses. So you can see what the cost of, a, of a, this type of an environmental offset would be to an individual consumer. It's about um, 21 cents per year. Uh, the farm rate is 650 per acre, and on a half a billion dollar company, it's about a million dollars. So it's not a huge uh, financial incentive. Again, it brings up questions of additionality. Is this $6 an acre enough to get a farmer to change his behavior? Maybe, maybe not, but if a farmer is participating in this program, they probably are already doing this, and it's really more about recognizing the stewardship, I think, than, than providing them with, with a, a, a materially financial incentive. Although with today's commodity prices, any, any bit might help with, with the farmers. Um, the other thing I want to talk about on this slide is the, um, the estimates for the corn bushels and the soy bushels and then uh, the acres of, of these. So chicken feed generally is about 60% about corn, about 30% soy, bean meal, and about 10% other ingredients, mostly bakery byproducts, kind of day old stale bread type stuff. Um, but within the corn and the soy, the, the corn acres, we, we use twice as much corn bushels or quantity as we do soy bushels, yet with the yield of corn being so high, over 150 bushels per acre and soybeans being closer to 40 bushels per acre, you can see the land use impact of soy is actually higher than the land use impact of corn for the feed ingredient sourcing for, for at least chicken feed, um, which I think raises some other questions around sustainability and, and that sustainable intensification. What what ingredients can really sort of provide the, the best way. And, and we want to have crop rotation. So we do want some acres of soy to rotate, but we also have to balance that the yield with, with other environmental benefits. And while corn might be a very intensive crop, it's also a very productive crop. So we want to freeze a footprint of agriculture and save land for wildlife. Corn might be uh, might have more to offer than, than a lot of other people. But that really, you know, that's, that's just part of the question, what do we do with the land? Um, and I think the other part of the question is, what do we do with the crops that come off the land? So if I back up from our company and look at the entire industry, depending on how you measure it, somewhere between 14 and 21 million acres of farmland is used to support the meat chicken industry. 14 million acres is a field steward model that I just showed you, the calculations there, and, and they're deliberately focused on only the, the meat bird. The 21 million acres is from an industry figure, and that includes the chickens that lay the eggs that become the chickens, and the chickens that lay those chickens. So there's a whole bunch of other sort of support aspects or support birds to the meat industry. So there's, there's a range, every, every environmental challenge like this is a big you know, scope and boundary question that you start with. So, um, Regardless of, of how you slice the numbers, the, the U.S. chicken industry uses about 11% of 
of the total crop, the total corn and soy acres in America. Um, slightly more corn and soy are exported out of the U.S. than what the U.S. chicken industry uses. And about four times more goes to ethanol with the, for our cars and, and the renewable fuel standards. So if we're really worried about feeding the people, we need to ask some tough questions about feeding our cars this much corn because the land use impact of the ethanol and other aspects of biofuels makes it really, really challenging. Um, the, I think it's good, the noble point, just jump to the last one here because I'm impressed for time. Let's see. Um, so the average person consuming 85 pounds of chicken, depending on how you measure the land use, would be about 1,300 to 2,100 square feet of farmland. And that's about the foundation of an average size house. And I just sort of want to connect some of these big figures with, with your daily life, that over the course of the year, if you eat as much chicken as a normal person, you're, the amount of farmland that you that is needed to support your consumption is probably about the size of the basement in your house. Uh, just a way to sort of connect your, your behavior to, to this world. So in conclusion, um, you know, this, the industry has gotten very consolidated, vertical integration is very expensive, and big customers like to play with big suppliers. Uh, McDonald's and Tyson, they might do the chicken nugget, that's a great example. Um, that, but across the supply chain, big likes to play with big. Um, so that makes it hard for smaller companies to scale up. Our, our company, Golden Plum, GMP company, we, we work with Target, they're growing faster than we are. We worked with Buffalo Wild Wings, they grew faster than we did in lost them as a customer. So it's, if you get a good customer and they grow faster than you, it can be a big challenge for a small scale producer. Um, the largest environmental impacts are in the supply chain. And while the field stewards example that I just shared with you is, is deliberately trying to bring those impacts into the competitive space, into the consumer and the grocery aisle, a lot of corporate sustainability efforts are not. Particularly field to market is focused on pre-competitive solutions. And, and that's uh, a little troubling for me. If, if we're going to compete on sustainability, then why are we pursuing pre-competitive solutions in, in terms of bigger programs like that? Um, and, and, you know, I think generally we, we know a lot of solutions to improve agriculture and to improve um, all sorts of energy efficiency across the supply chain. But a lot of times these are dismissed or ignored or they just don't have the bandwidth to, to do them. Um, so I think really the, the opportunity for small scale and local agriculture is, is to play a role in demonstrating this innovation and sustainability. And while the growth is, is strong, it's still a pretty niche segment, but a niche segment can really demonstrate the potential of something. And if you look at other categories, uh, cars or fashion or electronics, there's usually some high-end niche that demonstrates some new technology or some emerging innovation. And I think that's what uh, local ag can do for, for the food systems. They can demonstrate this potential. They can demonstrate pasture, poultry, or regenerative, all these other sort of buzzwords. They, the small scale is, is where the innovation can and should happen. And, and these solutions are out there. We just need to, to see them and pursue them. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And now, Ruth will wrap up the formal presentations. Thank you. Thanks to Jeffrey and to everyone who organized this event, and thanks to all of you for being here. I'd like to talk about heads and hearts and making sure we think about what we believe from the heart and what we think from the head when we're in this conversation about sustainable agriculture and small-scale agriculture. Food speaks to the heart, culture, tradition, family. Agricultural landscapes speak to the heart. They, they, they have a, an emotional connection with us. But I would like to make the point here, and I go what Paul said, about this is really about trade-offs. 
So we need to keep our heads on about the, uh, the trade-offs. Okay, so as we've heard, and as we all know, there have been enormous <laughs> changes in agricultural systems over the last couple of decades, and this uh, has led to incredible increase in the amount of food that the world produces, and cereals being the main one, that's what most of our calories come from. So just an incredible growth in the production coming from consolidation and, and the uh, processes that we've spoken about already. And what's amazing about this is that the per capita production has increased even faster than the increase in cereals. So population has increased, which we all know. But uh, the increase in cereal production has been even faster on a global scale than the increase in production. That is just incredible. That's enormous changes in the last couple of decades. So I believe it was in 1975 that Shoemaker uh, published his book, Small is Beautiful. I don't see as many gray hairs as I have <laughs> in the audience, so maybe this doesn't resonate with you. But Small is Beautiful uh, spoke a lot to a, to a whole generation, and I think it transfers into the next generation as, as well. So that, that very much speaks to, our, speaks to our heart, and it's a bit counter to what has actually happened in the world. But let's use our heads to ask the question, is small always beautiful and is big always ugly? And how do we think about the trade-offs? So in some places, small is absolutely beautiful and gorgeous and the Hudson Valley is one of those places. It's just such a community. I spend a lot of time up there. Jeffrey and I have been trading our notes about uh, how beautiful the Catskills is. Wonderful community, wonderful far farmers, fantastic food, wonderful restaurants, just beautiful. It's beautiful, as, as we've heard, because, uh, because there is this big consuming wealthy uh, New York City that is uh, down food shed of the Catskills, which can make it possible. I know it's very often difficult for the farmers there, but it, it's possible to, uh, to be part of that wonderful community. So in that case, I would say small really is beautiful. But I also spend a lot of time in, in a, a study region where I work in central India, very, very poor part of a poor country. And I would say small is certainly not beautiful there. There are farmers who struggle. They are the most vulnerable population. They live and die with the, whether the monsoons uh, are strong or not. Uh, very, very precarious existence. And 98, per, on a global scale, 98% of the farmers in the world are uh, small scale farmers. And these small scale farmers are the poorest populations and the most undernourished populations. Now there's an irony for you. The people who produce the food are the people who are the most, uh, the most hungry. So it's certainly not the case that small is, uh, is beautiful uh, everywhere. And this is very much borne out by this farmer here who, uh, who was telling us about her children. Her daughter is studying in college. Her son is off in the town. Uh, doing a, some kind of uh, uh, job, and she told us about this with pride that her farmers, her children, are not going to be farmers. They have found a way out of the poverty trap that many, many small scale farmers are, um, are, are trapped in. And this is a phenomenon that is going, taking place in many, many parts of the developing world. When, when people have an option to get out of small-scale farming, they will do it. And we see that in the trends in urbanization. So there's, uh, there's a lot to think about in terms of, do we want our policies to be promoting people to be able to stay in small-scale agriculture, what certainly most small-scale farmers in the world cannot uh, now have a, what we would call a sustainable livelihood based on small-scale farming? Uh, or do we want to promote our policies that would enable people to uh, get out of farming and improve their livelihoods with other, um, other strategies? 
And the answer is probably different answers in different places. But part of sustainability is the, uh, I believe part of sustainability is providing people with options where they can best use their talents and their passions uh, the way they think is best. So then we have to think, once we go to the global scale, where really are the consumers? If we look at population projections going out, we see that, uh, that almost all of the population increase in the world going forward will take place in uh, less developed regions. And all of a large, large, large proportion of that is uh, increase in populations in urban areas, either through growth of the population in cities or migration into cities. So then we have to ask yourself, where are the consumers? And the consumers in, uh, the high-end consumers in New York City and similar kinds of cities are a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the world's uh, consumers. So then we have to think about, well, how do, we, how do our agricultural systems provide enough production to satisfy the demands from an increasingly urban population, but not a uh, wealthy population. So big challenge there. So let's think about some of the trade-offs. So all of this is about trade-offs, to echo uh, Paul's comment. So we think about organic, and I buy organic when I can. Uh, but let's ask ourselves, is organic better, and what are the trade-offs? So here is a uh, results from a paper where the authors put together all the data that they could get a, their hands on about yields of organic production and yields of uh, conventional production. And they made a ratio between the yields of organic to the yields of ratio. So if the ratio is greater than one, which is on your <coughs> right side, that means that the yields from the organic production is higher than the yields of conventional production. If it's on the left side, left th less than one, that means the yields of organic production is lower than the yields of conventional production. And we don't see any of, of these points <laughs> to the right side where the organic production is higher yield than the conventional production. It varies, of course, <laughs> by, the, uh, by the type of product. But generally, the way the yields are currently, organic production requires more land, getting back to Paul's point. So here we have a trade-off. We have a trade-off between organic production, which, uh, which has the benefit of uh, not using pesticides and soil health and all of those wonderful reasons why uh, people spend extra money for organic. But it requires extra land. So here we have a, a fundamental trade-off. If, if the whole world ate, ate off of organic production, it would require more land. Now, is it worth it or not? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it's a trade-off, and we need to be using our heads to be thinking about that trade-off. Is local better? So food miles has been quite a popu popular concept. Uh, and here's another paper which put together information about where the greenhouse gases come from different stages along the uh, whole supply chain. So to the extent that people justify food miles <coughs> to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, these results don't really bear that out. And there's lots of colors here, but basically the point is the production part of the supply chain is where the vast majority of uh, greenhouse gases come from. The carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, all of the greenhouse gases, mostly coming from the production stage, as Paul said in his example. So the purple, the, the, the light blue, the orange, et cetera, everything above that is the, the greenhouse uh, emissions from the production side, and you see the red and the little blue there, that's the transport side, the delivery and the freight and so on. And that's generally, varies again by food type, generally not the major part of production. So if we're justifying local consumption uh, on, and producing food miles on the basis of greenhouse gases, our heads don't, can't really go along with that. But again, there's all kinds of other reasons for uh, local consumption. The community, the, uh, the the 
the delivery to restaurants, people like it, all kinds of other uh, reasons, but greenhouse gases, reducing greenhouse gas emissions does not seem to be something that goes along with the head part of this, uh, this conversation. Now we have another aspect which is about nutrition. After all, agriculture, sustainable agriculture is all about providing people with uh, nutritious food. So here we did a bit of an analysis which looked at this vast intensification that has occurred over the last couple of decades and we know we've had an enormous increase in production. But what, in terms of cereals, but what has happened is that we changed the mix of cereals. So if we go back to the 1960s, we see that there was much more of a mix of different types of cereals, barley and millet and sorghum and different types of cereals. And the world cereal supply has been, become more and more dominated by rice and wheat and to a lesser extent maize. But to the extent that the nutritional content of the cereals which are high yielding, which has been the whole focus of this enormous increase in production, they're less nutritious. So if you take the whole global cereal supply, it has stayed about the same in terms of energy content per serving per 100 grains, about the same as protein. But in terms of the micronutrients, which those other cereals are so, uh, so much more nutritious than the high yielding cereals, we see that overall the iron, in this case iron and zinc of the cereal supply per serving has declined. So here's another trade-off. We've gotten high yield, we saved some land because producing more on less land, producing lots of calories, but trading off in terms of the nutrient content of that supply. So the point I want to leave you here with is that this discussion is really all about trade-offs. How much land to be in agriculture, what nutrition comes out of agriculture, how we value local communities, how we value uh, farmers in other parts of the world, if we're buying local, we're not buying from farmers in other parts of the world who um, would be dependent on that production, on the climate impacts. This is just some of the types of trade-offs that, uh, that we need to consider. So the point I'd like to leave you with is let's keep our hearts strong. We all love our communities. We love the cat skills. We love the small-scale farmers where that makes sense for them. So let's keep our hearts strong, but let's keep our heads on and not fool ourselves that we are not uh, making lots of trade-offs. So let's think about how we, how we make those trade-offs intentionally rather than subconsciously. Thank you. Sobriety is hard work. <laughs> uh, I, I think this is, uh, the presentations have teed up the issues very well. Uh, we want to get past the image. We want to find out where local sustainable makes sense, where it does not, where large makes sense. Uh, let's take a five minute break, just that, and come back here at about uh, at latest 10 to and get into a panel discussion. So, again, thank you to all the speakers. I, um, I, I, I find the points you're making incredibly compelling, and I was wondering if you could speak a bit to areas where you feel that, that small agriculture actually does make sense um, based upon the work that you've done. Yeah, so um, small agriculture seems to make, small scale agriculture seems to make sense where there's a market for the product, where there's a decent livelihood for the farmer, where um, the farmer is farming by choice, not by being compelled because there's no other option for him or her. Um, and I guess where there's a competitive product. And I, I was very drawn to the comments from Paul about um, the small scale farming in that kind of situation where, uh, where the uh, technologies can be demonstration that might be able to be scaled up to uh, scaled up and incorporated at a larger scale. And what about in terms of the land base? You, you mentioned the Catskills, which we all love much, very much. That area is probably not suitable for large-scale agriculture, so the land is not uh, being denied access to perhaps more efficient operations, uh, whereas I, I had uh, been on faculty at Cornell, and, and in the uh, 
the Finger Lakes region of New York State, which is now dominated by smaller farms, it, it is it has very large valleys, and in fact, there's a major uh, an effort underway, probably unfortunately from the point of view of the local farmers, uh, for cor corporate consolidation. And that's an area which geographically it might make more sense. So uh, is, is that an important factor to consider? Yeah, I think that the whole Northeast um, used to be deforested mm -hmm. uh, because of farms, and then when the uh, opening up of the Midwest and the prairies and the, the rail lines to be able to produce more productively in the Midwest. That's when we see the farms abandoned, the small farms being abandoned and the forests grew back. So now we have the wonderful Catskills with, with its forested areas and its watershed protection, which was not there. If we looked at, if, I'm sure you've looked at pictures from say a hundred years ago or even less and it's just cleared out. It's just completely Cleared. So I don't think that's what we want for uh, for the Catskills, uh, the Catskills either. But I think that's another case, another uh, way where small scale agriculture does make sense, where it's it's less um, productive or less profitable to think about that area in large scale production. Great, thank you. And Paul. Um, I wonder if the audience understands that probably many of the people who are the farms who are supplying to GNP are, are smaller farms. Can you provide a profile of the, the typical farm that supplies to that company? And also, you had mentioned that uh, in the Farm Steward Program, it was field, field steward? Yeah. Field steward. Uh, that uh, the incentive was worked out to be about six fifty an acre, $6.50 an acre. And you said that perhaps that was not enough of an incentive to change practice but more giving the opportunity for farmers that already had good practice to be able to advertise it. If you could also speak to what you feel it might get, what amount of money and technical support might be required to actually change practice for farmers that were not already operating by some measure of sustainability. All right, well, let's see, I'll try to do the first part of your question first, because there's actually two parts to the answer in terms of farmers supplying us and what do they look like. So our company is based in central Minnesota and, and in Wisconsin. Um, and I'd say we have two critical farm partners. Um, the first one would be our contract growers, which have a, a chicken barn on their farm and, and are essentially chicken farmers. And, and that's a long-term relationship with the company. It's a fairly expensive barn. They, they get the financing based on our contract. We, we have, I think, one of the most equitable contracts with our growers in the industry. Um, but that's more within our sort of internal, like vertical integration. The, I think the question you're getting at is the, the farmers that supply us with our feed ingredients and particularly corn, um, we do source much more locally, uh, again up in the sort of northern edge of the corn belt where the, the farms and the yields are a little bit less than like Iowa where they're really, really big. But I, I think our, our we get our corn within about 40 or 50 miles from our feed mill. And I think the average farm size in that area is probably a couple hundred acres, maybe a few farms around 500 or over a thousand, but generally a relatively small scale uh, corporate sort of, or industrial farm. Um, and I think in terms of that, uh, supplying Golden Pump or any feed company or any local elevator essentially sources the corn from their local area. The farmers will, will probably don't have a whole lot of loyalty in terms of where they're going to sell. It's, it's who's ever offering the, the best price, but they got to deduct the freight or the transportation. So usually it's going to be the local guy. And, and um, you know, how much how much of an incentive financially do you have to offer farmers to get them to change their behavior? I, I don't think there's any amount of money. I don't think farmers act as economically <laughs> rational as they want to believe themselves to be. And I think a lot of them are motivated by farming the way they've always used to or having a perception of freedom to farm. And the ones who, who want to farm in ways that are destructive uh, often do so willingly, and I think there's a need to differentiate in pr production commodity crop agriculture, the ones 
who, who have no regard for the environment and the ones who are at least trying a little bit. And if you're trying a little bit, it's, it's again, probably beyond the economics of it. It's, it's an idea of this is what a responsible person does and everyone wants to think they're a responsible person. So I think the farmers that are going to participate in something like the field stewards program or even in some kind of other supply chain issue like field and market or SASB or anything else, are, are kind of pre-selected into the, the, the ones that have a conservation ethic. And there, I, I think it's more about recognizing that, eth that ethic rather than providing them with the material financial incentive. So the $5, dollars six fifty is a credit cost to the company, $5 goes to the farmer. The $5 an acre um, probably won't make or break a farm, but it's, I think, enough to be a, a, a way to recognize those farmers. And the other thing about that payment, at least in the current iteration of the program, is it's capped at, at about 50 or 100 acres. So the farmer's total payout from the field service is, is pretty small. Again, we, we don't want it to necessarily be like a material financial incentive for them, more of a recognition for farmers that are, are willing to step up and say, I'm trying to do what's right for the environment. Maybe the field service program is a good standard, maybe it's not, but it's a standard we're using to do what we believe is right. So let, let me stick with this notion of, of what would be an effective driver and turn attention to Michael and your work with SASB. Uh, SASB is establishing standards for I think, 80 different industries, including several areas of agriculture as you, as you would profile. Uh, how deep is the SASB, would you expect about the SASB standards to go in terms of companies that are, that are using SASB uh, uh, standards to report on their, in their uh, Security and Exchange Commission reports? How deep do you think those companies are going to push back up their supply chain uh, to assure this level of level of performance outlined in SASB standards? Yeah. Um, so I, I think the each each point in that supply chain uh, asks the question of how are you managing your supply chain, right? So. Um, the, the top level driver has to come from consumers who are demanding these products that have these characteristics. And I think, you know, Ruth, Ruth made the point earlier, you know, and, and um, Paul as well, you know, is there really a taste difference um, or, or a, a quality difference in industrial grown agriculture versus uh, sustainably grown agriculture? Not clear. Not clear. The other differences are in the psychographic characteristics that people want to feel good about it, but also in the uh, supporting the ecosystems and, and you know, longer term uh, uh, sustainable practices so that your yields don't drop off a cliff after you stop um, you know, putting the nitrous fertilizer on there, right? Um, but at each point, so, so there has to be demand from the top that's going to drive these companies to demand changes in behavior down the chain all the way down to the farm level. Uh, I don't know that, I think you're right, I don't think financial incentives of that kind are going to really motivate behavior to the farmers. It's, it's really too small a needle to move. But um, being, being denied access to a market because you're not using these practices, that's a stronger incentive. That's a more binary thing. And I think that's ultimately going to be what will, what will drive the behavior. And do you think the, uh, the SASB standards are likely to be a facilitator of that? One of the challenges with the SASB standards in agriculture, particularly, is that um, the three largest uh, grain aggregators are not public companies. You know, Conti, Cargo, and Louis Dreyfus are all private. Um, they probably control seventy percent of the of the uh, you know raw grain markets between them. Um, you know, I know SASB had conversations certainly with um, Conti and Cargo, and those companies. We're very much in favor of, of you know, implementing these standards just in their own business practices and management practices um, just for their internal measurement perspective. Um, but uh, again, they're private companies. They can really kind of do what they want. Okay, next step up. Do any of you have questions for your colleagues on the panel or other statements you'd like to make based on our discussion so far? I think just sort of a follow-up point on this financial incentive and what's the point of something like field stores or even SASB. And I think it's to bring some differentiation into the marketplace. And if 
we can start having a, a green commodity crop and a conventional one, now there's something that the supply chain can compete around. If, if the incentive connected to the differentiator might not be the, the big thing, it's more around creating a threshold or some basis for competition for environmental performance in agricultural supply chains. I think that's the bigger vision of particularly the field stewards program. Yeah, and I would just sort of echo one of something Ruth said earlier, which is that um, uh, you know the Catskills are wonderful. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, small. I think small scale uh, farmers can compete in value added products or in higher value um, fruits and vegetables. I'm not sure that they can compete in the scale commodity. That feeds into the question that I wanted to ask both of you about whether you think it's possible to have large-scale production of those commodities that the world needs a lot of, like cereals, uh, with sustainable practices. Uh, I think we can't not. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> I, I, think, I think we could get a lot better on the production of these, and I think the other half of it is, is what are we doing with the crops that we grow and taking a hard look at biofuels and, and some other sort of more intensive uses of these grains and cereals. There is, um, certainly there is a, a threshold for an operation uh, in terms of uh, financial capacity and, and management wherewithal uh, to just focus on organics for the moment, to become uh, USDA organic certified. It's a, a laborious administrative process, as well as uh, changes in land management practices. Uh, during my time, when I worked for US EPA and, and US Department of Agriculture, this debate raged, and so raged, well, it may not rage right now in Washington, I think we have other priorities, but up until a few months ago, it raged about whether uh, organic production could be comparable to conventional production in terms of yield per acre. And uh, a lot of debate back and forth about whether the studies that had been produced were, were accurate characterizations of one, one type versus another. And I, I think what, where the discussion is going at this point is that if indeed organic production is, uh, uh, uses the same principles of modern management that perhaps exist on larger, more conventional farms and have access to equivalent quality of land and access to capital and labor, uh, there probably could be a much narrower gap than the data is showing, uh, but we're not there yet. And uh, speaking to Michael's point, we have no other choice. We have to get there. Agriculture must be sustainable. So it's not going to be one class of agriculture that's going to lead the way. There will be innovation in different places, but every form of agriculture must address this uh, need to move towards sustainability. Again, organic, USDA organic has many elements of sustainability, but it's not completely sustainable uh, because it does it focuses more on the, the quality of the food in terms of chemical uh, inputs, but not as much on land stewardship. I know that's evolving uh, to, to more stewardship requirements, but right now it's not exactly the same thing. But by and large, without getting caught up in definitions, we need to be gravitating in direction of farmers that meet all the uh, farm operations meet all the criteria that we've been speaking about. Uh, but getting there is, is the process. And where is it going? Where is the innovation going to happen? Where are the resources going to be made available to facilitate it? These are the challenges of the day. So granted, I got you all in the room talking about small ag, but really I think at the end of the day, the issue is getting to sustainable agriculture. So any other comments from the panel? Yeah. Okay, so maybe we'll, we'll shift to, oh, I'm sorry, before I shift to Q&A, I have a, a couple of other people that I'd like to uh, introduce just to say <laughs> is a rather unique initiative that he has created. He is the president of the Grace Richardson Foundation, and he is promoting an effort to identify how we might incorporate into a, 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 a tax reform plan uh, measures that promote sustainability in several different industries, uh, notably in this case agriculture and forestry, and I've been involved with his planning effort there and asked him to come and talk a little bit about that initiative because I think it dovetails nicely into what drivers uh, we can create to encourage uh, more sustainable agricultural practices. So I'm going to let Rod, come on, that's fine, he's standing there. I'll let Rod stand over there. Go ahead, Rod. Sure. Uh, yeah, um, 
I'm with the uh, Grace Richardson Fund. Uh, uh, our mission is to uh, pioneer new free market solutions to critical issues in gridlock. And um, one of the uh, areas we've taken on is the whole area of negative externalities, pollution, and problems associated with that, like climate change. Uh, so um, an idea that we proposed uh, just last year, publicly in June, is called Clean Tax Cuts. And it's a, a rather uh, surprising application of uh, supply-side economics to the problems of pollution and negative externalities. Um, a supply-side economist uh, would tell you uh, that if you want more of something, tax it less. And if you really want to make a big impact, target the capital taxes that investors pay uh, on, uh, on, on, those, uh, on debt and equity in those clean solutions. Um, what that does is it has a twofold effect. Uh, it increases the ROI of these uh, projects because you're, you're driving down the taxes, so they're more attractive. So you capitalize quicker, but also by driving down those tax rates, uh, you also lower the cost of capital, which means that you lower the cost of outputs a lot. So for something like uh, uh, solar uh, or wind production, where it's very capital intensive, um, you know, the, the work of uh, Professor Travis Bradford here at Columbia indicates that uh, just two or three percentage points off the cost of capital, which you could get by uh, driving down, uh, you know, the, those tax rates, uh, would uh, uh, translate into 20 or 30 percent lower cost of clean energy. Uh, so that's a pretty impressive uh, drop and an interesting way to, with one policy, uh, drive uh, both supply and demand. And um, we we uh, we held a, a a couple of charrettes here at Columbia about figuring out how to use clean tax cuts in different sectors of the economy. Um, the first charrette was held last September, uh, and we identified a number of different sectors where this could have uh, an impact. Uh, Columbia, uh, under Travis Bradford and the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law decided to focus on the green bond market. And there you have some really interesting, very powerful applications. I see we have a couple of alumni from that charrette in the audience. Uh, Sache Bose from uh, the Earth Institute back there helped us uh, a great deal in crafting some of the solutions. But, you know, there the, um, the applications are very, very powerful because you, you are essentially creating a, you know, if, if you, one, once, to give you an example or a flavor of these kinds of solutions, which would help agriculture, by the way, because uh, even solar power can be installed on farms and you can use bonds to do big projects across a number of farms. So uh, it would be an interesting thing. You could do uh, zero emission uh, bonds uh, where you're doing a zero emission power project, any kind of thing, wind, wind solar, or what have you. Uh, and you give it muni bond treatment triple tax free. So what you've just done is essentially create this new class of security halfway between a municipal bond triple tax free and a corporate bond with a higher interest rate, but it's corporate bond triple tax free. So that means it's a lower cost of debt for the issuer than anything else they can do. And it's a higher triple tax free return for the investor than anything else they can get. So that makes a very, very interesting class of security with a lot of potential. It's a very efficient way to, to finance these projects and deploy you know, hundreds of millions, if not trillions of dollars with the capital towards clean solutions. You've already, you know, the, the municipal bond market is 3.7 trillion. The US corporate bond market is 35 trillion. And you just created a class of security that's arguably more attractive than either. But so, I may add sure. something there because it yeah, well, the point which might be two. Yeah, which might which might force. Sure, let me just mention this because I think it dovetails nicely with what you just said. You might not see the obvious connection to what, between what Rod is talking about in agriculture, but many small farms that are only netting maybe thirty, sixty thousand dollars a year in personal income may have as much as one or two million dollars of investment on that farm because it's incredible. most farms are incredibly capital intensive in this country. So having mechanisms similar to what Rob is talking about might make a dramatic difference for the profitability of some small farms. And I know I've been involved with the dairy industry, and, and they're trying to finance digesters that will process the manure into useful products. But these digesters can cost upwards of $5 million for a small farm. 
and they don't have access to capital. So mechanisms like this could make a huge difference. Uh, exactly. Um, and, yeah, and, that, and that brings us to the, uh, the uh, charrette on uh, forestry and farming that was conducted by the Nature Conservancy uh, just last month. Uh, and uh, Jeff came down uh, and participated with us in that. Uh, we had Rodale Institute, the Nature Conservancy, and uh, climate advisors for the co-hosts of that. Um, but uh, that charrette uh, came up with some very interesting proposals. Of course, the challenge in the farming area is uh, exactly what everybody on this panel has been talking about, and that is that the, the standards for what constitutes sustainability are challenging, to say the least. And there are multiple different kinds of certification. Uh, there isn't, you know, in, in, in real estate, we had an easy time with the real estate shred deciding what's clean, because we have Energy Star, right? Energy Star is a really crystal clear mechanism for, you know, saying this is a, uh, it has an environmental benefit to it that's well understood. You have a certification, you have a scoring system from 1 to 100, boom, you know, you have a, a method that's crystal clear. We don't have a farm star, right? We could use a farm star. That would be really useful if you had a way to certify uh, farms as sustainable and you had a 1 to 100 score and you could say, boom, we're done. You know, you, 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 you figure out a way to put that together. And I would challenge you guys to come up with it because it would be very, very useful. Uh, and you could, you could drive clean tax cuts off of, of a certification system like that very, very well. Um, and, but right now, what we're forced to do is we could use clean tax cuts, but they would be driven off of a patchwork of certification systems uh, that would have to be, you know, and there would be some debate over who, which, whose certification system is included and whose is not, and whose is meaningful and whose is not. Uh, but, you know, I, I can tell you, you know, the ones that, uh, you know, that were mentioned, uh, you know, in the, in the uh, charrette as being most attractive to the charrette participants were the uh, uh, field to market uh, as, as a, you know, as a very broad-based uh, uh, standard. Uh, ANSI, the, the LEO 4000 uh, certification system, um, uh, and also the organic certification system. Uh, because organic may not be exactly sustainable, uh, it, it is sustainable certification, but it, it does tend towards sustainable a uh, great deal. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm sure that, that uh, field stewardship uh, probably should be included in that, as well as a, a, a number of others that you guys could mention. But, you know, you could do some very interesting things in the clean tax cut realm, you know, if you had, if you, had the, you know, something that you could put together. Because, um, the, 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 well, let me just step back before I go into that and just say, the second challenge we had with, with farming, you know, is that farmers, you know, uh, I was told, uh, typically don't have a lot of taxable profit uh, because of the way they operate uh, with, with uh, you know, subsidies, etc. Uh, so the challenge is, where do you get the point of leverage in the system? And one of the uh, things that we looked at was, well, what about all the people around the farmer? What about, you know, we talk about the supply chain from the farmer to the consumer, but what about the people who are supplying the farmer, right? So you have some very interesting people who are supplying the farmer with services who are making profits, right? You have the banks giving them farm loans. You have the insurance companies giving them crop insurance. You have uh, John Deere, uh, you know, a Caterpillar selling them tractors, for instance and you folks like that. So what if you had a way of certifying farmers, right, or, or choosing from some of the existing certification systems, and you said to these, these the bankers, the insurance guys, the tractor providers, okay, your revenue from selling to a sustainable farmer uh, will be tax-free or taxed at half the rate of everything else. And that applies to your corporate income tax and the taxes that your investors pay on dividends. So you're, you're really going to want to sell to those sustainable farmers as much as you can. So when a farmer would go into a banker or to a, a crop to get, buy crop insurance or go buy a big ticket item like a, a, you know, 
know, a, a piece of farm equipment, which these things run 200,000, 500,000 for some of them. They're, they're very expensive, digesters, whatever. They're, they're asked, um, are you a sustainable farmer? Because if you are, I can give you a lower price, right? And if they're asked that every time they go in, uh, that makes an impression. <laughs> you know, so, so that, that's, one, that's one kind of clean tax debt mechanism. Um, a couple of other uh, clean tax debt mechanisms that uh, we could run through. There's an existing clean tax debt mechanism that exists in the whole area of conservation, and that is the tax deduction for conservation easements. It's a tax reduction. Uh, and so the one of the one of the suggestions was to uh, enhance that by saying that um, sales of conservation easements or sales of land for conservation purposes would be exempt from capital gains tax. Uh, that would be a mechanism to to really drive further conservation uh, in land ownership. Um, uh, a couple of other things that you could do is if you had a good uh, sustainable, uh, a, a good system for uh, certifying farms as sustainable would be green bonds uh, for sustainable farming. Uh, you, you know, one of the things that they recommended in real estate, in the real estate track, was that there, there are already people who are doing uh, bundled energy star loans, Fannie Mae's issuing such bundled uh, securities that are, are now mortgages. You could give uh, municipal bond treatment to those if, uh, for, uh, for sustainable farms. So the mortgages on sustainable farms could be tax-free uh, and the bonds could be tax-free. So you could help finance the sustainable farming preferentially. That would be an additional incentive for, for farmers. Um, and so securitizing those loans would be great. Um, one of the things that was uh, suggested was that, um, well, that, that comes under the same thing. But in any event, I think I'll, I'll stop there. But that gives you a just a flavor for some of the things that could be done in the farming space with uh, clean tax cuts. But obviously, one of the one of the things that they we could go into is. And probably I would suggest the future shred decide is what kind of equipment is necessary for sustainable farming. And the if you have, like you, you mentioned the digesters, right? If you have certifiably clean equipment with a with a environmental impact, uh, you could uh, do clean tax cuts for the manufacturers, installers of that, and also bonds and loans to help uh, pay for that kind. That would be another uh, application. And uh, probably another complexity of, of exploring tax cuts is that, uh, green tax cuts, is that uh, we're not talking about a rating system where you get a score of 1 to 100. This is a binary system. You fill out your tax form, you either qualify or you don't. I put solar on my house. This physically solar sitting on my roof. I got the tax credit. Uh, when we talk about agricultural standards for clean or sustainable, uh, we're going to need something that is a yes or no answer that is straightforward that the tax, tax system can facilitate. Uh, and by the way, I just want to make one more closing comment and then if you can say a word or two. Uh, you may be scratching your head thinking, this administration, this Congress, tax cuts for sustainability? Uh, I felt that way when I started engaging with Rod in the Charette process, but we've been speaking to scores of people who were close to this administration. and. Uh, there seems to be some willingness to explore this. I'm, I'm very, very impressed by that opportunity. Right. You know, the entire purpose of our effort over the last few months has been to develop simple, uh, high-impact, practical proposals that can be inserted into the current dialogue on tax reform. And one of the interesting things is that we've been able to do uh, charrettes involving such things as oil and gas. So. One of the interesting things that's very attractive to conservatives is that you can use uh, clean tax cuts to drive the oil and gas sector cleaner to get them to reduce waste and, and turn it into profit uh, rather than blowing it into the air as, as GHGs, right? So, so these kinds of mechanisms have the, the capacity to appeal across party lines. 
which is uh, one of the things that we're finding and, and getting a lot of positive feedback on. Well, Rod, thank you very much. Uh, I have one other person I'd like to invite up before we go to the audience Q&A. Uh, Susan uh, Terrier uh, uh, Chang is, uh, is with an organization called the uh, uh, the Capital Institute, and if any of you were here last year, you might have met John Fullerton, who was one of our speakers, who's the president of that foundation. Uh, the foundation advances uh, development of sustainable or regenerative economies in many sectors. Uh, Susan is in charge of their, uh, their case study process, and she's going to speak about a very innovative food hub that's developed in, uh, in Seattle, Washington, I'm sorry, Portland, Oregon, rather. I always get those cities mixed up. Uh, that is probably taking the notion of a food hub further than anyone else is taking it. So, Susan, please. Yeah, um, I, I first wanted to hand out or distribute something about the field guide. Uh, we're really not case studies exactly, we're kind of a storytelling project. And um, Capital Institute, I guess we would call ourselves a regenerative economy think and do tank. And so we. We think a lot and then we really looked for applications of, of what we imagine a regenerative economy should look like in the real world. And the field guide is now in its seventh year and we've been telling stories uh, about over about 40 projects, mostly in the United States but all over the world. And I have this little handout because we were in Buffalo last week and if anybody wants it. But anyway, um, I, first of all I wanted to congratulate you. This is just an amazing conversation and for someone who's been telling stories about the regenerative economy I feel like I have so much to learn and I would love to like do stories with all of you because you just got my mind just really really racing with ideas but um, a little bit about Red on Salmon um, it is a food hub on I guess it's about two acre, a two acre campus in uh, the industrial section of Portland Oregon was started about, uh, by an organization called EcoTrust, which is an amazing, innovative sort of nonprofit and for-profit organization that has been doing a lot of deep thinking about, about the food system, and specifically in the Northwest, which they call the um, Salmon Nation. And the red, um, and you were asking me, um, Jeffrey, what that was, and the red is um, a spawning ground, I believe, for salmon. So they created this physical structure where they bring together, I guess there's like three functions. There's a managed warehouse where um, the small producers, farmers, fishermen, and ranchers can drop off their produce, put them into a warehouse, have a small desk to do paperwork. Um, and then there's, there are production kitchens which use um, these pro this produce to make their whatever wonderful things that they make from it. But the most interesting part of it is uh, Northwest Food Buyers Network, which consists of, I think, of about 65 um, purchasers for large institutions. And I think this is where, you know, when you're, what you were talking about, Ruth, the, uh, the idea that this might be something that could be, be applicable in these countries where these small farmers are just not talking to each other and they can move from small to ag in the middle where you know, they can start to make a profit. But having a physical structure where they can all come together I think is really, really important. And um, for, the, for the, the purchasers, it's this opportunity to realize that they do have an, they have an alternative from, to buy from uh, an alternative from buying from the um, the commodity food market. That said, you know the people at um, Echo Trust don't think that the small producers will ever be the be on an end all for the for the anchor institutions. They understand the resiliency issues. You know, if the local farm system collapses, you know they have to buy from someplace else. So it's this idea that you have the small, you have the medium, and the large, and it all. You know, we don't have to be adversaries, and I really loved, you know, what Paul was saying. I learned so much. Um, we did another story on a, on a farmer, uh, it's a dairy, conventional dairy farmer, who actually went, moved out of the cooperative movement and into, became uh, a partner with Dan and Yogurt. And Dan and, um, it promises, promises them through some contractual arrangement, you know, a bottom price. And as a result, this farmer can actually institute some amazing 
sustainable practices in terms of, you know, paying a living wage, guaranteeing their farm workers, you know, all kinds of benefits. Because they have this contractual relationship with Dan, and so this is wonderful, um, you know, partnership between between a middle-sized farmer who wants to do the right thing, and and Dan Yogurt. So, uh, I would encourage you if you have time to look at the field guide because we have a lot of other great stories about about the food system. Um, and I, there was just one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, we share space with a group of um, investors who are um, working for regenerative food shed in, in the Hudson Valley, and they've actually just purchased a farm in the Hudson Valley and are working with, Har I think it's uh, Hawthorne Valley, uh, to try to incubate some more food, food businesses in the Hudson Valley. So it might, might be of interest to you as, as well, Michael. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, there's a lot of this innovation bubbling up in this field and uh, desperately needed. I was part of an enforcement inspection team uh, that went down to Alabama about three years ago when I was with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And we went down because we were concerned about how well the state was regulating animal agriculture. We found some problems, absolutely. Uh, we were also told to be careful where we go because we might accidentally run into a meth lab. That was, that's a sidebar issue. But um, I stumbled upon a dairy farm, which truly speaks to this issue. This was a fellow in very rural Alabama uh, who was producing an incredibly high quality product. His animals were primarily on pasture. Uh, he uh, had uh, very good animal welfare practices and uh, was managing his land very well in terms of uh, controlling runoff to avoid uh, pollution to a nearby stream. Uh, if you were in New York State, if you were in the Hudson Valley, he'd be selling his product at incredible price premium. But when I asked him how he was marketing his product, he said, marketing my product, I have one option. There's one cooperative, I sell to the cooperative, I get a commodity price, period. Now, this guy certainly had access to the market. I, I don't want to characterize him as being denied access to the market, but he was probably getting a, a price for his milk that was dramatically lower than he might get if he were closer to an urban market and able to take advantage of the high quality product he was producing. So having these effective ag intermediaries, uh, whether it be food hubs, whether it be technical, financial assistance, marketing assistance, is critical for small and more sustainable farmers to, to, to take advantage of their, uh, their value added and enter into the marketplace effectively. So uh, thank you for providing that case example. And, and Rod, thank you for describing, hopefully, an opportunity to help incentivize farmers to produce sustainably. So now we're at the audience Q&A portion of our program, and um, Megha and, um, and Brian are gonna come down with questions that the audience has posed. If you have any other questions, please see them, and um, we'll take it from there. All right, so I think our first question was from Professor Bose. He said he loved the value chain analysis of the food sector that the speakers presented. Can you explain why we would expect farmers and or consumers to bear the burden of sustainable practices when the most concentrated and therefore most profitable part of the industry is in agro-processing? Well, <laughs> I'll take a crack at this. Um, I, I often joke the golden rule in business is whoever has the gold makes the rules. And I, I think that might be the answer to this is, you know, who's ever holding the, the purse strings for these producers is going to have the influence. And as we were talking about with the taxes and so on, if you can engage the whole ecosystem around the farmer, send a consistent message around sustainability equals this standard or this way of practicing, I, I think you can get through to that. Um, but I think it does need to be some sort of B&B part business to business partner. Um, the general public has less understanding of all these standards than even the experts, and the experts don't all agree. Um, if I could uh, you know, take a crack at that one. One idea that I didn't mention, which I, I think is actually a very good one and right to this point, is that in addition to uh, using clean tax cuts with the folks that supply the farmer, you could use the same thing with people who sell certified products that are certified sustainable, certified organic, however they want to certify them as, as being sustainable. But uh, if you do that, uh, then you do 
incentivize those processors to ask for more and more sustainable products. So, so it, you, the point about plain tax cuts is you, you have to look for the points of leverage. And the points of leverage are where people are making the money. Okay, and if it's the agro-processors, then that would be the point of leverage where you want to think about the plain tax cuts. So, to the degree you can incentivize them to, to do that by reducing their tax rates, and also for their investors and the managers who have stock packages, etc., uh, then you can really change the, the corporate culture and drive sustainability. Um, I don't know the exact number, but I'm going to take a guess here that you know your four dollar and fifty cent box of cereal probably uh, twelve cents of that went back to the farmer or something like that. Shop. Okay, thank you. Our next question. What, in your opinion, is the number one impediment for a young person to take on the desire to be involved in agriculture as a livelihood? Capital. <laughs> access to land. Well, that's capital. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you can get access to land if you have money. <laughs> that's easy. <laughs> um, I would say another impediment is that many young farmers don't come from farm families. Uh, they don't have the history of working the land. Uh, many of them have not even gone to ag schools. Uh, so there's a need for technical assistance at a very basic level, uh, any farm, uh, that just doesn't exist right now. But the, the Cooperative Extension Program, which I was once part of, uh, is an amazing program nationally. In fact, it's been emulated in many other countries to provide university-based research to farmers to help them advance their practice. And unfortunately, that program has been dramatically defunded over the years. And where it was funded, much of the land grant universities did not focus on sustainability and agriculture. That's beginning to change. And as I was telling Ruth before, uh, my experience is primarily because of stubborn faculty, not necessarily the university, embracing sustainability. The faculty saying, this is important. I want to do research in this area. So those are things that are really a couple of things that are missing from small farmers and trying to enter this field. Uh, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit, Jeff. Um, there is a, certainly here in New York, um, an active community that is that is promoting new entrants into the into the uh, uh, farm practices. Uh, NOFA, for example, runs uh, seminars in January on. Uh, tell me the acronym. Uh, uh, NOFA, uh, New, York. New York Organic Farmers Association, I believe it is. Yeah. Um, yes. And they do a seminar, uh, a two-day um, intensive on. Um, which is really designed to bring new folks into the community as well. Um, I, I think the knowledge is out there and the training is out there. And at Cobbercy, every one of our employees has worked on a farm in one, one place or another. So um, there are young people who are getting into this. Can I just answer that from a developing country, small scale farmer perspective? Is It's backbreaking work. It's really hard. And it's a very, very precarious existence. How can new technologies be utilized to improve small-scale agriculture so that it would be competitive to large-scale agriculture? Um, I think, you know, technology, we, we jump to like the self-driving tractor or something like that. But I think there's a lot of other technologies that can help around the storytelling, the distribution, the innovation around financing or, or other standards. So I, I think if we want to create this marketplace and we want to look at creatively how to reduce the barriers to entry and, and other enhancements to the, the competitive landscape in agriculture, we, we can start looking at some technological solutions or, or more broadly the sort of Silicon Valley approach to innovation and so on to, to help break open this into something where it's, it's invites more entrepreneurs into the space and therefore allows for more competition and innovation. Anybody else? Oh, I would just say that um, you know having uh, value-added products, you know, on, on farm production of value-added products is a critical way for, for small-scale farmers to compete up the value chain. Okay, can you also discuss urban the urban agriculture renaissance in the inner city? and its importance in the food production systems. As the world becomes more urban, can cities provide more of its own food? 
So I think that's certainly true in the vegetables and um, the production that doesn't take a lot of space, but most of the world's calories comes from cereals, so it's a little hard to imagine. Um, the scale of cereal production that's required um, being in urban areas, so it may contribute to some types of products, but not to the main one, which is most agricultural land, which is cereals. I think the main point of urban agriculture is to remind everyone that food comes from somewhere. Um, yeah, and from a poultry perspective, having a lot of distributed small flocks doesn't sit very well with the industry because it's potential for bird flu or other sort of disease vectors like that. So the, the sustainable merits of backyard poultry you know, should get a hard look at it. But I think having a garden and reminding yourself where your food comes from are definitely worthwhile. This one's for Dr. DeFries, but please feel free to chime in if you have something to answer. It says, regarding your comments on land-based and organics, some questions about the underlying assumptions. One, do we not have enough land for meeting human caloric needs currently or in the future? Two, is food insufficiency the result of insufficient food production or access, distribution, etc.? And three, will non-organic slash fossil fuel-based systems be viable in the long term, post fossil fuel, fossil fuels being cheap. You might have to repeat all of those. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question about um, the the land. Can you repeat the first? Yeah. Do we have? Do we not have we enough not have land enough. for meeting okay. human caloric needs? Uh, there is more food in the world produced than is necessary to meet caloric needs. So there's certainly enough production. If the issue is the distribution and the uh, access and the nutrition that's coming from that production, not the total amount of production itself. That said, according to the estimates, in the future, there will need to be some increase in production. Uh, and where will that come from? So there's more land out there. There's uh, there's the Amazon, there's Central Africa, there's, there's land. But again, it's a trade-off. So how much land goes for agriculture? How much land goes for habitat for wildlife? Or carbon storage in forests? Or biofuel production? Or all of the other reasons why uh, we value land? So if we want to produce more and we want to put all of the land available into agriculture, then we could produce a lot more food. But there's lots of other reasons why we would think about why we wouldn't want to do that. And the second question I think is answered in that is that, uh, yeah, there's more than enough food in the world. It's, it, it's a question of uh, access and distribution. And the reason why people don't have access is because they, are, um, they can't afford it, because they're poor, which gets back to the, the small scale farmers who are poor and can't afford to produce the, the purchase the food that's required. Okay, and the last question was, will not or get, oh, you want to take it? sorry. I just want to add a comment on the, the food. In, in the developing world, a lot of the food waste is in the field, yeah. sort of right. before it gets to yeah. market. In the US, it's you know in your own refrigerator, you've thrown out half of what you buy. But it's back to the, the access and the money, and people don't have the money to even buy the food, and most food insecurity issues. Well, I would just add one more point around um, sort of food production and security, which is around um, you know consumption of animal proteins relative to the vegetable proteins that go into produce them, and how that balance could easily you know if, if we started to run out of food, we could easily shift away from consumption of animal protein and demand of money again. We might have to scale back on consumption of Fritos corn chips, and that may be the downside. <laughs> Um, Michael shared a, um, a very interesting article with me earlier this week from the Wall Street Journal about U.S. losing its preeminent spot in uh, in providing global, being a source of global grains. Uh, Brazil, Russia are, uh, I think there were one or two other countries that make dramatic inroads into that market. Uh, what I thought about reading that article, though, was that much of that land up until recently was in rainforest or other functioning habitats. Uh, so we may be able to meet food needs without uh, maybe even being forced to change our diets or give up our junk food, but, but 
why I'm building on what Ruth was saying. What would be the cost of that? Uh, uh, maybe exacerbating climate change. So we've got to think about all these trade-offs again. Okay, the last part of the question is, I'll just rephrase a bit, kind of will traditional fossil fuel-based agriculture be viable in the long term once fossil fuels become more expensive? Uh, yeah. We're not, um, we're not going to run out of oil because oil becomes too expensive. The long-term value of oil once we convert to a non-carbon energy system is going to be a few dollars above the cost of production in the lowest cost fields, which are in Saudi Arabia right now. So look to $15 a barrel of oil, but not because we're running, not because demand is exceeding supply. That would be my yeah, statement on right. that. And if it does get expensive, we'll find more oil. <laughs> We have too much oil. The problem is not that we don't have enough oil. We have too much oil. Okay. Uh, why is the U.S. government wasting so much money on corn and soybean subsidies when these largely support unsustainable farming practices? <laughs> why does everyone look at the industry guy? <laughs> Does anybody have a 10 foot pole? <laughs> um, this is, you know, our, we have a representative government that responds to their constituents. And these rural voters show up and vote, attend the town halls, and the people in the cities sit at forums like this and talk about it. And, <laughs> you know, we're, I, I think it's just the effectiveness of the egg lobby and getting what they want. and sort of an extension of the military industrial complex and the idea of, of building out an egg system that could source us up for some kind of prolonged war and we need this infrastructure and it just feeds into this sort of brain soup of, of more is better. Um, but if we challenge the political order, we can challenge the policy. I would also say that probably the political um, trends that led to the, the standards for inclusion of biofuels in the U.S. fuel system predated a lot of the um, tremendous growth of the U.S. fuel, uh, the U.S. oil uh, industry from the new fracking um, technologies. I think it's fair to say that the agricultural lobby is very strong in many, many countries. In Brazil, it's extremely strong. I think it's a general phenomenon. And I think part of the reason it's so strong is it deals with the land, it deals with culture, security and a lot of other aspects. It's really a root system. So you pull one string and egg and find out very quickly it's connected to sort of everything else. Okay. Labor shortages and fair labor practices, which are closely tied to immigration, may be the greatest threat to our current agriculture system. Can, can each of you talk about uh, how you have been affected by this issue and if you see any solutions in the future? Let me just mention something briefly. Uh, one of the challenges in uh, restricting immigration uh, has uh, primarily hit hard on, on organic production, which tends to be more labor intensive. And I think many of the organic producers in California have been raising uh, quite a bit of concern about restricting immigration or, 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 ex or uh, encouraging, or I don't know what the proper term is for it, but uh, removing people in this country who are not here legally, because many of those people are working on organic farms, and organic farms need a lot more people per unit of production output than conventional farms. Uh, so uh, that uh, strict policy against immigration tends to hurt labor-intensive operations, which tend to be more sustainable operations. Um, I think, I don't, again, I don't know the exact statistics here, but I think the average age of a U.S. farmer is in their 64, 65 now. And the average age of some of these um, microworkers workers they're not 22, 23 anymore. They're in their 40s now. Um, and they're not being replenished either. So the, the challenge, the immigration issue is a challenge, but the bigger issue is the demographics around who's going to be doing this work, um, which is why you see developing a lot of technological solutions these days. I think the other part of it is labor in the food system beyond the field. Um, for our chicken plant, it's pretty efficient, but once we get in the plant, we're going to product in a package and so on. We have hundreds of employees in the plant there. And then one step further down the chain, if you go to a restaurant and so on, um, and I think the demand for food service type products and people not cooking at home 
else is going to drive this trend and, and a more restrictive labor market is, is going to curtail some of the growth and, and the more value added food products regardless of sustainability. Yeah, I don't have much to say, add to that, except to say that it's clear that um, immigration is so important for the, for the economy and in, in many domains. But, um, but the, our human, our, the tendency is to co compartmentalize our thinking into immigration because of whatever other reasons people focus on immigration and not think about it in terms of the whole system. So why is immigration important for different parts of food production or different parts of the economy? And really that's what education is all about, is to be able to think about the, the system in its, in, it, in its holistic sort of way so we don't end up with um, these counterproductive kinds of policies. What can be done to empower farmers to reach the end users directly so that the cost of the tiers can be eliminated or reduced? Um, I, I don't, I don't, again, I don't see a large, for, for the, for the major, you know, caloric crops, cereals, um, it's going to be awfully hard to see a path for, you know, direct to consumer uh, marketing. Certainly, in sort of you know, there's CSAs for vegetables and fruits and those sort of things, and I've seen you know meat shares and and you know direct to consumers for um, for you know poultry even and, and uh, uh, cattle, but uh, I just don't I just don't see how that happens in, um, for bread. So I think those things happen further up. For instance, there was the uh, soy moratorium uh, against soy produced in. Brazil that involved deforestation, Greenpeace led this effort and it mostly came out of the EU for their soy that they were importing to feed chickens and it was extremely effective. So that's not at the consumer level, that's, that's further up. Um, at, at GMP we launched a brand called Just Bear and part of our Just Bear brand was you could trace your chicken back to the farm that grew it and by the time we got privacy concerns dealt with with our farmer, it kind of was a little hokey, it was like Farmer Bobbins little stick <laughs> figure on the website. Um, but consumers really, really liked the idea of being able to type in a code on the package and know exactly where the product came from. But almost none of them ever use the tool on our website. So the idea that consumers actually want to do this is probably an assumption that, that should be challenged. Consumers definitely want the ability to do it. Are they going to do it? Are they going to do it effectively? Are they going to do it accurately? You know, I would be skeptical of all that. But I think in order to connect the producers to the consumers, we, we have an opportunity to apply in our age of sort of radical transparency and quantifying everything. A lot of these technologies could be used to help better tell that story. What are some proposed changes to farm regulations? How might these affect sustainable, sustainable farming and sustainable farmers? Uh, not good. <laughs> I, um, I had the pleasure of listening in on Farm Foundation webinar a couple of weeks after the election. And uh, it was, uh, some of the featured speakers were from the uh, uh, Heritage Foundation and some of the other right-wing think tanks. And basically, they were looking forward to the next iteration of the Farm Bill, which would be the 2018 Farm Bill. And uh, their view is they fully intend to get back to basics, which means uh, get, uh, less support for innovative farming, less support for sustainability, uh, more focus on commodity crops. So unfortunately, uh, that's the only news I'm hearing from Washington. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be much I think it's consumer demand that's really going to be driving the trends that, that will affect change going forward. Okay, thank you. On the, other, on the other spectrum of achieving a higher yield in agriculture, where do you stand on reducing the waste on the levels of production that apply to you? Statistically, we waste a quarter to a third of all food produced and consumed. Why don't you talk about your operation? No waste, minimal waste. So yeah, so you know, we, we operate an organic farm at Copper City. Um, we grow grains, we process those into distilled spirits, and then we recycle those out into uh, 
animal feed for the pig series. Um, but you know, we are uh, we are a fairly small scale operation, um, and we can do this you know effectively at our scale. Um, <clears throat> I, I think you know you were making a point that you know a third of the crops are wasted in the fields in India because they don't have the collection infrastructure to get it to market and store it and handle it effectively, and you know a tremendous amount of um, post uh, you know sits in the refrigerator and or you know post restaurant gets wasted here in the U.S. Um, smaller portions, better planning. Um, India needs a lot of infrastructure um, in terms of development of um, you know uh, uh, grain handling and elevators and all that stuff to uh, to keep that stuff from from rotting. Um, you know these are big challenges. Much you know for, you know we can we can sort of operate at a small scale and kind of point the way. Um, but the larger changes are going to happen, have to happen both bottom up and top down. I, I can speak to a couple of examples again in the dairy industry. Uh, these are not finished product waste, these are wastes in the production process. One I know a lot about, one I know just a bit about. Uh, we talked a bit about anaerobic digestion. Uh, many of you in New York might be uncomfortable by talking about manure, but manure is one of the major byproducts of livestock operations and for dairy, uh, modern dairy is performed where the animals are primarily in, in confinement uh, in barns uh, and that means the waste is not available on the land to, I'm uh, sorry, I should not use the word waste, the manure is not available on the land as a nutrient for the crops, it is collected and stored and occasionally reapplied based upon, based upon agronomic standards, meaning you only put enough down because the plants will take up those nutrients. Uh, but often that's not the case. Often it's applied just to the waste management strategy, get rid of it before the regulator shows up. Uh, so one very innovative approach is anaerobic digestion, which is basically taking that material, uh, creating a digestion process, and uh, creating methane gas as a byproduct. That methane gas can be used for electric generation on site or for cleaning and, and compressing and put out into the natural gas grid. Also, the, process creates nutrient materials which can be used as feedstock and fertilizer, solid materials which can be used as animal bedding or to produce value-added products. Uh, these facilities also ge can generate renewable energy credits, as Paul was talking about before. Water quality credits if they're operating in an area that's uh, constrained by too much nutrient pollution. And uh, carbon credits because they avoid use of uh, fossil fuels. Uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, fossil, uh, carbon credits because the methane is not released out to the environment which is an incredibly potent greenhouse gas, but it's used to produce electricity. Uh, this is an incredible waste management strategy, but only uh, about 150 of these systems are deployed throughout the United States, not because the technology is new or, or challenging, it's because uh, these systems, the, the markets, that there are no markets available for the most part for all of these byproducts, these seven different potential revenue streams. Uh, every, every environmental management strategy that I've just described has a potential revenue stream, but in most areas they are not well developed yet. So as a result, manure is still land applied, probably not according to agronomic uh, pri uh, principles, but just to get rid of the material. So granted, I know when you think about waste management, you're thinking about, I'm sorry, avoiding food waste, you're thinking about avoiding the waste in your kitchen or, or in storage, but this is a major source of agricultural waste in this country. And because we haven't come up with the market structure and the financing for the investment, uh, we haven't seen this being deployed, being deployed at a rate that is commensurate with the volume of, of this material being generated. Uh, a medium-sized hog farm can generate as much uh, manure as a large city. Um, in Germany, there are 3,000 of these units. Uh, the economics are different there, and they don't have the problem we have as a result of that. Uh, another area, I'm sure a lot of you like um, Greek yogurt, it's become quite the fad, uh, Giovanni has uh, become a big name. Uh, Greek yogurt is a much more milk intensive process and there's a byproduct called whey, which uh, has value in the marketplace, but there's too much of it available and it's getting land applied. Uh, so now the industry is starting to do research in utilizing whey as a, a feedstock for other industries, but it hasn't, it hasn't evolved yet. So we need to create the systems to utilize these materials Hopefully not wasted food, hopefully all the food is utilized, but even, even waste food can be brought back into the system through uh, food composting operations. Uh, we live in Brooklyn now, this is one of the few communities that has a compost collection. Uh, so these systems need to be put in place, the economic incentives have to be created, financing structures are needed, so 
there's not an incentive for wasting what is a valuable resource. Thank you. In terms of land use, small operations have a greater opportunity for permaculture versus large-scale farms that are mostly monoculture farms. Isn't a big issue the way we farm, not just farm size? Well, just from the poor farmer perspective, um, it's often difficult to have permaculture or, or tree trees because of the, the investment that's required and you have to wait for however many years to get, get a return. So it goes back to the credit question. So um, in, in that case, where small scale farmers don't have they are doing monocrops because that's how, the, how their economics works. There could be more opportunity to have agroforestry, more biodiversity, more, more tree cover um, if the, the credits work differently. And uh, permaculture is a very exciting aspect of agriculture, as Bruce Roof was referring to it. It's creating symbiotic relationships between different plant communities to optimize output and to minimize the need for human attention. But it does take time. And uh, unfortunately, although permaculture as a, as a practice has been around since the late 1970s, there is not a lot of science supporting uh, how to optimize permaculture systems. And as a result, if you want to be a permaculturist, you've got to design the system for yourself for the most part. You've got to wait the amount of time and, and go through the trial of error of getting the system just right. There are plenty of anecdotal tales of permaculture farms that are getting 50, 30 to 50 thousand dollars an acre, correct me if intensive. It's hard to believe, but these are just anecdotal, anecdotal tales at this point. We don't have the, the scientific rigor to, to verify whether these systems are productive, what it takes to operate them correctly, and that's a major failing right now in testing out whether these types of, uh, of intensive bio, intensively managed systems actually work and justify the labor investment. And the, the investment note, it's very capital intensive to get land, it's even more capital intensive to set it up for the permaculture system. And if you do the permaculture, it's probably a few years before you start reaping the, the benefits of that. So you're going to have to have a lot of capital for a long time to get into that game. Okay, this one's for Michael. Have you considered asking your farmers to experiment with growing perennial grains? Um, so some, yes, uh, there are some varietals that, um, I think of, of rye particularly, that we've looked at that are, that are sort of perennial. Um, you know, one of the things we looked at with that is, you know, we do want to rotate and we do want to, you know, we do um, have fallow uh, years. So we are typically on a four year rotation uh, on our fields um, with one year fallow. So that's, that's actually a fairly, uh, light use, right? I mean, most most farms are, every year you've got something on there, you're harvesting. Um, but we do want to let the land you know, have a chance to reset and rest and, and uh, um, go through that. But yeah, we, we, we've looked at some of that. Yeah. Okay, great. We're down to our last question, so thanks for bearing with us. With all the local political engagement since November, there's an enormous opportunity to give this mo movement sustainable agriculture policies to advocate for. What are some state and local policies and actions that can be part of this progressive agenda? I, I like Paul's idea of the uh, of you know creating that separation and certification between um, those who are at least trying to do something and, and those who are not. Um, I do think that naming and shaming is a powerful motivator to. I don't have specific answers to the question, but I've noticed lately that the New York State Department of Ag and Marcus has been staffing up to provide support for small farmers. Uh, they've got some interesting programs, new labeling programs, uh, new uh, programs to help farmers get access to land. Uh, if you want to read an article which tells quite the desperate, gives a rather desperate painting of the picture of how tough it is to be a small farmer, uh, read an essay that was in the New York Times perhaps about three years ago called Don't Let Your Children Grow Up to Be Farmers by a fellow named Bryn Smith who actually runs an oyster and uh, uh, seaweed operation in Rhode Island. And uh, 
it's a, it paints a very, very bleak picture of how, of how the deck is stacked against small farmers. But you could look at it from a different perspective and say, and see this as a listing of the things that government agencies and other, other entities like foundations need to do to help advance farming. It's a, a very good template. Although when I've spoken to my small farm friends who tell me that uh, life is certainly tough in this region as farmers, uh, they say it paints a picture a little bit too, too bleak for, uh, uh, for the reality. But nonetheless, take a look at Department of Ag and Market, see some of their initiatives. I think that would give you a good idea of what government can do. That's it? Yep. Great. Thank you, Brian. Uh, to, uh, just to close up, we've got like, another seven or eight minutes. If anybody has a last question, they want to come up to the microphone opposed to us, just to, to wrap up, we can do that. No? Okay, everybody's all... Oh, yes, please come down. A, a quick comment. Um, Why don't you come down to the mic so we yeah. get it on tape. Couldn't um, hold back. Um, Jeff, you said before that there's a lack of business technical assistance for small-scale sustainable farmers. And although there was, and the cooperative extension system has been defunded and has changed a lot, there's actually a huge proliferation of technical assistance service for small-scale sustainable farmers. You mentioned NOFA New York. Uh, I, I run a program called Grow NYC's Farm Roots Program. We provide technical assistance to 240 or so farmers across the region, and there's a national technical assistance conference for sustainable small farmers happening uh, in Albany uh, in mid-May to kind of go over a lot of these issues that you're talking about. So just wanted to, to, to clarify that and point that out, but there's, there's a lot, as the sustainable movement develops, there's also a lot of support uh, and understanding that these issues need to be ironed out. So, um, is your organization involved in helping, farm, helping young farmers get access to land? Yeah, we've we've graduated 360 or so beginning farmers from our farmer training course, our business training course. 75 of which had started farm businesses over the last 10 years or so. So, and a huge part of that is the access to land piece and the access to capital piece that goes on. So, Hudson Valley is tough. I'm Chris Wayne. Uh, I work with Grow NYC uh, in New York City. So, Great, thank you. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so Chris, before you go, let me yeah. pose another question. Uh, we've spoken quite a bit about access to land from the perspective of helping farmers to buy land, uh, but there's been a lot of discussion now about matching up older farmers, older landowners who either can no longer farm or are losing interest in farming with young farmers who don't have the land but have the capability and the energy. Uh, are you familiar with any of those programs? Yeah, in fact, we run uh, established farmer technical assistance for the folks who sell through the green market program. So there's 200 and so producers. The average age of those folks is about 70. 50% uh, of them have no identified successor for their farm business and plan to retire within the next 10 years. So there's going to be a huge transition of land in New York State and across the region. Uh, and it's a big goal of ours to keep those farms in agriculture and in business. Land conservation, which was brought up previously, is a great way to bring down the property value so that beginning farmers can actually access a piece of land in Dutchess County, which is really only available to Wall Street folks and, and, and people who want second homes at the point right now. So a big part of what we do is put together the puzzles between uh, established farmers and retiring farm businesses and those younger farmers that want to get involved. So, and yeah. Leave your I will. I yeah. you to uh, the uh, Sustainable Agriculture Forum for 2018. Great, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all for being here, and very much I want to thank the panelists. Uh, you brought a tremendous amount of expertise and perspective to this issue, and uh, stay tuned for next year. Thank you.